I'd like to welcome you to our fifth annual public hearing on prescription drug prices. My name is Andrew Stolfi. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Oregon State Insurance Commissioner and the Director of the Oregon Department of Consumer and Business Services. We're very glad to have you here with us today for this public hearing. We have a lot of information to cover, and as usual, we're going to have two public comment sessions to hear directly from you. We encourage you to sign up to provide testimony using the chat function. You're also welcome to email us any written testimony after the hearing. And I should note that this is a public hearing and we will follow public meeting laws and regulations. So I'm privileged to serve as the facilitator for this public hearing. And we're also very fortunate to have with us four legislators who will help moderate questions and discussion periods. And now let and uh, welcome each of our legislator moderators to introduce themselves and provide uh, a brief statement if they'd like. And we can start with the list right there on the screen. So Senator Patterson, you get to go first. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Stolfi. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Whoops. And I will turn on my video. Sorry about that. It's a pleasure to be with you um, I, again this year. Uh, while this is the fifth annual um, hearing, it is probably close to 10 years that um, we've been working in partnership on um, drug uh, price transparency. Um, I'm I'm Deb Patterson. I'm uh, um, Senator from South and West Salem, Monmouth and Independence in Senate District 10, and Chair of the Senate Health Care Committee. And we all know that um, uh, prescription drug costs are the fastest growing segment of health care costs in our state and in our, in our country. And so this work of investigating and reporting on health care um, costs, um, particularly on pharmaceutical costs, will help policymakers and agency staff and the public to understand the drivers for these costs and to um, form good public policy moving forward. Transparency is key. And so thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone at DCBS um, who works on this, um, this issue for your work on pharmaceutical drug affordability. We look forward to the program and um, good afternoon to my fellow legislators who are with us today as well. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Representative Goodwin, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, Representative, I, I believe your yes. mute might be on. Good afternoon. <laughs> Christine Goodwin, State Representative, House District 4. I am serving as Vice Chair on Behavioral Health Health Care Committee. And so, of course, conversation on um, all matters relating to health care, particularly prescription drug prices and how that overall affects cost to the consumer is of great interest to me and very happy to participate today. Thank you, Representative, uh, so much for being here. Uh, Representative Javadi. Hello, my name is uh, Cyrus Javadi. Uh, sometimes they call me Javadi. But uh, <laughs> House Representative for um, District 32, which is Tillamook and Clatsop County. Um, in my uh, day job as a dentist. I uh, mm -hmm. work with, uh, in a general dentistry practice here on the coast, and um, I also serve on the healthcare, uh, behavioral health and healthcare committee with uh, Rep. Goodwin. And uh, sometimes I even get to talk to Senator Patterson. Uh, good to see you there, Senator. And uh, we have had, um, I'm looking forward to this conversation to discuss um, prescription drug prices. So uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, Representative. Glad you could be here. I know Representative Nose was uh, having a connection issue. I'm sure he will be here shortly. Uh, in, in the meantime, uh, I can share a little more information as for who we are. So we are the Department of Consumer Business Services, which is Oregon's largest consumer protection agency. Our Division of Financial Regulation protects consumers and regulates insurance depository institutions such as banks and credit unions, trust companies, securities, and consumer financial products and services. It also administers the Drug Price Transparency Program and provides staff support for the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. Uh, during today's hearing, I uh, will be sharing information about the Drug Price Transparency Program, which was created by the 2018 Prescription Drug Price Transparency Act. 
We will also discuss details from the program's 2023 annual report, which is available on our website. Uh, you're going to hear today from invited panelists on two important topics. So the first topic is the impact of diabetic drugs approved for weight loss. And the second topic will be what determines the cost of generic drugs and why, so, uh, why are many so expensive. Uh, we're also going to have two public comment periods uh, and already have several people signed up to testify. Uh, before this hearing, we also invited Oregonians to send us their stories about prescription drug pricing. And I'd like to share a few of those stories with you now, as I've done each year. So first, we heard from someone that for 2024, my current plan D increased the annual deduction from $100 to $145, increased monthly premium from $54.70 to $65.20, and changed my aliquis charge from a $47 monthly copay to a 20% of total monthly cost. The current three-month cost is $1,797. It's like being in the donut hole all year. Another person shared that. My husband's on Medicare and an AARP plan, and he pays out-of-pocket $460 every three months for Jodiance and $400 for Aliquis. These are required to keep him alive, her our primary doctor, and not due to the ridiculous advertising we're subjected to nonstop while watching TV. We're both on fixed income and cannot afford this. One step we should take as a nation is to ban prescription advertising to the public, as is done in most countries, except for the U.S. and New Zealand. Someone else commented that I'm on 14 different medications. I spend more than my mortgage every month and still have to split pills and cut back wherever I can. My so-called insurance company recently denied my prescription for a medication I've taken for nearly 20 years, and it is the only medication that has ever worked for me. My doctor appealed twice and they denied it twice. I cannot afford a $360 copay or the over $1,100 for a 30 day supply without the insurance. I've just literally spent the last two weeks in bed sick. Finally, one consumer shared, uh, my struggles with obesity began in my teens. It wasn't until I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome and thyroid issues in my early twenties that I began to understand why no matter what fad diet or crazy exercise routine I tried, I was absolutely unable to lose weight and keep it off. I find myself in my mid thirties, three small children and sicker than, than I have ever been in my life. I filled 14 medications at the pharmacy every month for comorbidities of obesity, but nothing actually worked to treat my obesity. Finally, in 2014, I had bariatric surgery and it was the best decision I ever made for my health. Even though I was able to lose hundred pounds and move from a more morbidly obese BMI to a normal BMI, I still struggled even when I was maintaining all my healthy lifestyle choices after surgery. It wasn't until my doctor added FD-approved anti-obesity medications for my treatment regime that I finally felt relief from the constant hunger and food obsession. Once I lost my job, anti-obesity medications have never been covered by any of my employers or insurers since. Out-of-pocket costs are $1,500 and are completely unaffordable for means. This means I'm unable to afford and utilize any of the FDA-approved medications for obesity at the available obesity doses. This also means that my other medication costs have continued to increase as I've had to add med additional medications to treat comorbidities of obesity. The purpose of healthcare is to improve health and quality of life, not to save money or make a profit. Cost and coverage issues are keeping new, safe, and effective life-saving treatments away from people who need them most. Anti-obesity medication should be affordable and covered just like any other medication for a serious chronic disease. Individuals should have access to at least the same level of discounts that pharmacy benefit managers and health insurance plans receive. Drug manufacturers should offer long-term long patient assistance programs to reduce out-of-pocket costs like they do for other chronic disease states. Obesity care should be equitable. Not covering proven, tre proven treatments for people with obesity is discriminatory and rooted in weight bias and stigma. So these are just a few of the real life stories we receive that demonstrate the difficult choices facing many Oregonians and why this program is trying to determine what can be done to make life-saving and life-improving medications more affordable. As always, you can read all of the stories you received in our annual report. So before inviting Ralph Magris to share a few words, uh, I do wanna mention, as I have each year, that the lawsuit filed by the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers Association, Pharma, 
in federal court in 2019 seeking to invalidate the laws that authorize this program remains pending. We have submitted all briefs for a motion for partial summary judgment related to House Bill 4005 and are awaiting a hearing before a new judge. We anticipate the court's decision in 2024. Farm is no longer challenging the portion of the case related to House Bill 2658. We can, cannot comment further about the ongoing lawsuit, but remain disappointed that they decided to challenge these laws designed to provide transparency and to help Oregonians better understand why drug prices are rising. With that, I'd like to introduce Ralph Magrish to talk about the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. Thank you, Andrew. Hello, I'm Ralph Magrish. I use he, his pronouns. I'm the executive director of the Oregon Prescription Drug Affordability Board. I also manage the Drug Price Transparency Program. Just a few brief words about the activities of the Drug Affordability Board, which was created under Senate Bill 844 during the 2021 legislative session. At our meeting next Wednesday, the board will finalize its recommendations to the legislature on ways to make prescription drugs more affordable for Oregonians. Of note, two of the board's recommendations from its inaugural report last year were included in Senate Bill 192 from the 2023 legislative session and were specific to the drug price transparency program. Specifically, the bill created a reporting mechanism for pharmacy benefit managers to report each year to DCBS on the aggregated dollar amount of rebates, fees, price protection payments, and other payments received from manufacturers relating to managing prescription drug benefits for carriers. We will begin posting that information late next year and report out at next year's hearing. Senate Bill 192 also expanded reporting requirements for all state licensed health insurance carriers, as the program currently only includes individual and small group markets to the drug price transparency program on their top 25 drugs by spend, prescription volume, and year-over-year -year cost. This change will allow the transparency program to have a more complete picture of carrier drug cost and expenditures. Also next Wednesday, the board will release its 2024 work plan for conducting drug affordability reviews to identify those drugs that may create affordability challenges to Oregonians and the healthcare system. You can view and review all board meetings and information on the board's website. Beginning in February, the board, staff, and our contractor will also begin developing an operational and implementation plan for upper payment limits on prescription drugs subject to affordability reviews. We will deliver this plan and report to the legislature next September as required under Senate Bill 192. This work will include development of an upper payment limit methodology, analysis of resources required, and an explanation of savings to the state, to insurers, hospitals, pharmacies, consumers, and 340B covered entities. More information about stakeholder meetings will be held in February through April, and more information, or those meetings rather, will be, be conducted in February through April, with more information available beginning in December. Lastly, I want to express our collective appreciation and gratitude for all those participating today, especially to those who are willing to share their stories and to our panelists and moderators and to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. And Andrew, just a quick word, we are still working on some technology issues with Repnos and hope to have him online soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, yep, uh, texting with him and uh, he's, he's trying as hard as can to be here. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, all right, so first up on the agenda is going to be the department's presentation, and that's going to be followed by the first public comment period. Uh, then we will have our two panels. So after the presentations for each segment, there will be time for moderators to discuss the issues and ask questions. And the end of the hearing, there will be a public hearing for as long as we have people who want to comment. So I encourage you, uh, again, to sign up in the chat if you'd like to share some comments. All right. So let's move on. Uh, first, we have Sophie and Numi who can provide information about the Drug Price Transparency Program and its report. Over to you. Great, thank you so much, Andrew. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for participating today. I am Sophia Para. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the program coordinator for the Oregon's Drug Price Transparency Program. I'll give you some information about the program and then Numi will take you through highlights and recommendations from our 2023 report to the legislature. 
Our website is divided into uh, different program areas. You can click on the annual reports and you can see the report that we posted last week, as well as um, going to and checking out our hearing. You can see um, reports that were uh, posted previously. There's also the place to check the data and a place to do consumer reports. And then um, on the public hearings part, we will post the slides that you're seeing today, and we will also be posting this recording of this hearing um, later as well. Okay, the Prescription Drug Price Transparency Act created the Drug Price Transparency Program. The Oregon laws give the program authority to require reports from manufacturers and insurers. Prescription drug manufacturers who meet the definition of reporting manufacturers, as shown on the slide, are required to participate in our program, and they're also required to pay fees that fund the staff for our program. Not all drug manufacturers meet this definition. There are some who have um, products that are not defined as prescription drugs. There are some who manufacture for a different company who actually um, prices and sells the drug. And then there are those that aren't available in Oregon. Next slide, please. I'd like to share this supply chain diagram that we also included in our annual report. It just gives you a, a somewhat of a picture of all the different people who have a part to play in getting a medication from a manufacturer to the consumer. And, and it depends on the type of coverage. This is a diagram is for a brand name drug with in somebody who has insurance. It takes a lot of steps um, to get there, and I think there are some that probably aren't even included on this diagram. Next slide, please. The programs that um, gets different reports from manufacturers. We get reports for new drugs if the price is $670 or more for a month's supply. Uh, we get reports if there's an annual price increase of 10% or more. And then we get reports if there is a price increase that exceeds the certain thresholds that you see there. Um, and those incre planned increases are due 60 days before the planned increase date. Um, we also get reports from insurers once a year on their 25 most costly drugs and their 25 most prescribed drugs, as well as those that have the impacts on premiums. Um, pharmacy benefit managers, um, we're going to get a start getting reports from them next year, and this will be on the rebates that they get from manufacturers and where that money is distributed. An important part of the program is to get information from consumers. Uh, we really need consumers to share about their price increases. Um, what this helps us get is from the manufacturer's cost to what the consumer is actually paying, and we can see and connect the chain as to um, what are these consumers paying. And so if you can report those to us, that really helps us get more complete data and a more complete picture about um, what we really care about the most is what the, the drugs cost to consumers. And we're trying to help get some transparency in that. So those reports are very helpful. And we wanna encourage consumers to submit that information to us if they, um, they have a price increase or they have a family member who has a drug price increase and they can report those to us. That is really helpful. We also encourage consumers to send us stories. Um, you can, you'll see on the report, there's an exhibit that shows all the stories we've received in the last year. And so we like to include stories that we get from consumers in the report as well. Um, the reporting, um, the price increase report for consumers comes in other languages and you can just give us a call. We are glad to help help you um, get that information submitted to us. Next slide, please. Wanted to cover some information about our compliance efforts on manufacturer reports. When a manufacturer files a report, we'll review it. And then if it's a little bit um, unclear on some areas or there's some information that's missing, we'll send a request for information letter to the manufacturer. Um, we've found that when we look at those responses from those requests for information, there is a lot of times where they're still lacking. And so um, it, that's, in those cases, what we do is we send a non-compliance letter to them and that gives them 30 days to correct the issues and get us the information to complete the report. Um, well, through the follow-up notices um, and our, our talks with manufacturers directly, 
our compliance specialists are able to get almost all of them to be in compliance and um, get the report fixed. And we've also noticed that through these efforts that have been made is that the data quality has improved greatly as well. Um, for those that do not come into compliance through this process, we send them to the enforcement unit where civil penalties can be imposed. Next slide, please. Wanted to give a little information about trade secret claims. When a manufacturer files a report, there are several data, several data elements where they can claim a trade secret, like um, amounts spent on manufacturing or marketing, those types of things that they don't want um, publicly displayed because they keep it tightly controlled within their company and it's not uh, really out there. And so when that happens, we need to review those claims, each one, and look for see, to see if the information is available publicly. If we do not agree um, or they don't justify it as required by Oregon law, you know, their, their claim, then we send a letter of determination letting them know that we do not agree with the claim. They, that gives them 15 days to appeal the decision. Um, once the determination is final, we post the information that is not eligible to be excluded um, on our website. Next slide, please. Um, just to give you an idea of the quantity that we're dealing with here, um, the, the DPT program has received more than 1,900 reports with over 10,500 data elements claimed as trade secret since the report the program began. Um, in just the past year, it's been 475 of those um, reports. We've had, in 2022, we hired a compliance specialist and we've processed 140 reports with trade secret claims. Our compliance specialists have also been able to convince some manufacturers to remove trade secret claims when they're inappropriate. Um, we will continue to keep reviewing the incoming ones and then trying to work on these older reports to get those finalized as well. Next slide, please. And we have information on our website that might interest you. So I just wanna make sure you're aware of it. You can go to the consumer webpage um, portion to report a price increase. There is a data portion where you can look up the manufacturer reports that I was talking about that we have published. You can also look up consumer reports that um, other consumers have published. You can look up those reports by the manufacturer name or the name of the drug. Um, on our insurer part of our, of our webpage, you can look at the compilations of the top drugs received by insurers each year. And then, um, of course, you can check out our annual report and to the legislature and our uh, public hearing information. Um, I'll also post something in the chat here that I wanted to make sure uh, people are aware of Oregon's Array RX program. Um, and so I'll post some information that was included in our report about that, just for awareness. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll just, um, these are just a cute few of the key findings from our um, 2023 drug report. The highest price increase on a new drug reported to us was $3.5 million. This is for um, Hemgenix, a hemophilia B treatment from CSL bearing. The largest percent increase on an annual price increase was a generic drug. Um, it was a generic vitamin A solution by Casper Pharma, 25% price increase, up to $718.75. And, and, uh, and then, of course, once again, Humira, made by AbbVie, uh, continues to be our most costly drug reported by insurers. And that exceeded $75 million in 2022. I'll let Numi go ahead and take over to report some additional information. Hey, thank you, Sophie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Numi Rayfield Griffiths. I use she, her pronouns. I am a senior policy advisor with the Division of Financial Regulation. Um, and I, I apologize if I am a little bit stuffy today. I'm recovering from a case of COVID. So uh, if I have to pause to uh, blow my nose a few times, I apologize. Uh, let's see. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go over some highlights from our report for this year. Uh, this is showing the uh, 
number of total number of reports that we have received by a year over the five years of the program for from drug manufacturers. So on the left side, you have uh, new specialty drug reports. As a reminder, that's uh, for drugs which are $670 or more for a 30-day supply. On the right side, you have the uh, uh, annual price increase reports uh, displayed, which is, uh, so that is for drugs which are $100 or more for a 30-day supply and which have seen a 10% year-over-year increase in their uh, price, average price throughout the year. Um, this is divided between both and is displaying both brand and generics. So the blue bars are uh, brand drugs and the, uh, the uh, orange bars are generic drugs. Um, I think the only thing that I'm really going to note here is that we've seen an increase in reports for both categories this year. So we have seen uh, a steady increase throughout the life of the program in the number of new drug reports. Um, and on the other hand, we have also seen throughout the life of the program, we have been tending to see a decline in uh, the number of price increase reports. So this has been due to sort of a change of strategy from a lot of manufacturers to uh, have a large, higher list price, but to do fewer price increases throughout the life of the drug. Um, and that trend has changed this year. This is actually something we were expecting based on uh, data from other sources that 2023 has been a year for a lot of price increases. And so we received uh, more price increases uh, this year than we have over the last three. Um, next slide, please. Just to kind of say, this isn't just inflation. Right? Like we know that inflation has been high for the last three years and due to COVID-19, the aftermath, all sorts of other things. Um, so this chart is comparing the uh, average price increase reported to us. So for those drugs that have one on, uh, $100 for a 30 day supply and any price increase year over year of more than 10%. Uh, so that's the blue bar is showing the average price increase across all the drugs reported under that category. And the orange bars are showing the inflation rate for the, for the year. So 2021, 2022, we did have significantly higher inflation. This is uh, basically taken from CPIG. So the consumer price increase, so consumer price index general stat, um, which was around 7% in 2021 and 2022. Whereas the uh, drug price, uh, the average increase that has been reported to us has been very steady throughout the life of the program. It's been around 15 or 16%. So this isn't something that's really being driven by inflation. The uh, price increases we see are significantly higher than inflation and in fact have not seemed to be affected by inflation at all, that it's remained steady, uh, even, even though inflation had been around 2% for the last couple decades and went up to 7% for 21-22, down to 3.5% this year. It's still something where we've seen steady price increases through uh, for drugs throughout the life of the program. Uh, next slide, please. So this is showing uh, some data that we collect on profits. This, again, comes from our price increase reports, uh, where drug manufacturers who have qualifying price increases have to report to us a, a number of different numbers. One of those is the amount of revenue that comes in for a particular drug, and the other is the uh, actual amount of costs, the number, of, the amount of direct costs associated with that drug. So using those two data points, we are able to calculate sort of an estimated profit margin for that particular drug family. A um, couple things I'll note here. So first off, big caveat, like I know this graph is really spiky. That's largely because this doesn't reflect the entire universe of drugs. Um, this is only reflecting those drugs that had a qualifying price increase and needed to uh, submit a price increase to us. So um, you can look at so the generic median price increase that we've seen that orange line, okay, it's been real was really high in 2020, 2021. That's not because there was the generic drugs in general had unusually high profit margins that year. That's just because the drugs that happened to have qualifying price increases and reported to us those years had really high profit margins. Um, so that's not necessarily reflective of sort of typical generic manufacturer profits. Uh, but what I would note is that the uh, profit margin reported by brands has been much more stable, um, that it started at around 15% the first year of the program, collected data, and has gone up to around 20% now. 
Um, so there's been a slight increase over the life of the program, which may be indicative of things that are going on throughout the marketplace, but we don't have enough data to be certain of that. But looking at the generic side, you do see these very large profit margins. And I want to talk about that a little bit more with the next slide, which is showing a direct cost reported by manufacturers. Um, so as I mentioned before, one of the things we collect is direct costs associated with a certain drug that has reported a price increase to us. Uh, the numbers reported to us are broken down into spend on manufacturing, spend on marketing, spend on distribution, and spend on safety and effectiveness. Uh, and what you'll note here is that for generic manufacturers, almost the entire pie is taken up by the cost of manufacturing. That just because of the nature of their business model, where they're primarily going through um, a wholesale distributor listing in the catalog and not really engaging in uh, safety and effectiveness research to a significant amount or engaging in marketing because it's not actually really necessary, <laughs> you'll see that uh, the generic manufacturers reported only 2% of the direct costs associated with distribution compared with 12% on the brand name side and 13% uh, for marketing compared with 33% on the brand name side. And uh, like, like just thinking back to the uh, consumer story talking about drug advertising and the fact that many countries have in fact banned advertising for prescription drugs, so there's something to look at there with the percentage of spend by brand name manufacturers on advertising. Um, but kind of to go back to the point that I wanted to make here, which is that it's not necessary, it's not unexpected for generic manufacturers to have the same, the sort of high profit margins that we saw in that last slide, because there isn't really a relationship between the price that is charged by a generic manufacturer and the cost of production. So the overhead costs and the costs, the, the, the list price of the drug is not closely connected. What we've found from our reporting over the years is that uh, generic manufacturers typically set prices as sort of a, a fairly modest discount off of the brand name if they're the only generic alternative available or kind of close to or slightly undercutting all of their competitors in the generic space. And so pretty much they set that wherever the market will bear and the rest of it is profit. So seeing something like a 40% profit margin isn't actually that surprising as we saw on the previous slide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to get a bit into some uh, data that we uh, derived from our insurer reporting. Um, this is showing the percent of claims reported to us by our nine reporting insurers um, that was uh, prescriptions related to COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so we saw a big drop from 2021-2022 uh, from around 25% of all prescriptions being COVID-19 vaccines to down to less than 10%. Uh, so that's a pretty substantial drop of 537,000 prescriptions down to 124,000 prescriptions. Um, I, I think a couple of other things to note about any of these things that are taken from our insurer data is, so for the first five years of the program, we've only been collecting this data with respect to small group and individual insurers. And I think that was mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, next by, uh, by Ralph. Um, is next year we're actually going to be collecting uh, data from a much wider swath that we're going to be collecting uh, data from all state regulated insurers. So that includes large group uh, employers. So that's going to be a big expansion of our data pool and we'll be able to get much more uh, a much more comprehensive picture of kind of what drug spending looks like throughout the marketplace. Um, <laughs> So you should note that this does only reflect data from about a quarter of insured lives in the state, but it could be reflective of low uptake of bivalent vaccine boosters in 2022 and beyond. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is breaking down the percentage. And so this is based on the total spending on prescription drugs by the carrier, nine carriers who reported to us this year uh, by basically by drug market segment. So generic drugs, brand name drugs, and then specialty drugs. And for our purpose, specialty drugs includes both brand name and generic drugs, which uh, are kind of above that price threshold. Um, I think the important thing to note here is that uh, for all the insurers reporting, the majority of the spend was on specialty drugs. 
even though a majority of prescriptions were for low-cost generic drugs. So what we are continuing to see is that the bulk of prescription drug spending is being driven by a small number of very high-cost specialty drugs uh, that are for a relatively serving a relatively small population in each case. Um, the one other thing I'll note here is that uh, Bridgespan reported 91% of their spend on specialty drugs, which Moda did as well. Um, and with respect to Bridgespan, looking through the data, we're able to see that uh, almost entirely that is due to a single drug with a very small patient population. And I can't be more precise with that without risking the privacy of the patient and the patients in this instance. But uh, this just goes to show that um, very high cost specialty drugs for a small insurance company, if one of those people comes into coverage through that company, can be a very significant impact to their risk pool. That this is both the majority of their drug spending and is also actually, if you go farther back in the data, is a majority of their total spending on all claims is due to the single drug. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is showing a breakdown by market segment between individual plans, small group plans, and large group plans in terms of the amount that is spent per member per month, which is a pretty common measurement that we use in, terms, in insurance terms. Um, and so this is showing uh, both the amount that is typically spent by a consumer uh, and the amount that is typically covered in an average month by the insurer. So uh, the blue bar is showing the percentage, so the cost sharing or the copay or the uh, co-insurance that was paid by the uh, consumer, that's the blue section. The orange section is the percent that is, is the uh, chunk that was paid for by the insurer. Um, I think what you should note here is that even though we are very focused on the uh, cost of prescription drugs to consumers, this is really showing the impact on the cost of prescription drugs to insurers as opposed to the consumer, that even when there is significant cost applied to the consumer, on average, most of the cost, the vast majority of the cost is being covered by insurance. Um, I think the other thing to note here is that, uh, that we do see that uh, prices are significantly higher excuse me for a sec here, um, the cost is significantly higher for individual plans than for small group and likewise small group to large group. And that is just really showing, you know, I, th I think something that we all know intuitively, but maybe this demonstrates uh, visually is that uh, the larger your risk pool is, the more consumers that you, the more insured lives that you have under an insurance company the more power they have to negotiate for prices. And so that is why we see the lower prices, lowest prices for large group plans and the highest prices for individual plans, which are typically serving a much smaller population and likewise for small group. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is showing a breakdown of the percentage of prescription drug spend, which was covered by rebates. Uh, so uh, rebates are, <clears throat> excuse me, Rebates are paid by manufacturers back to insurers and PBMs. Under the normal model, they're negotiated by PBMs. Um, I, I don't have a lot to specifically say on this slide, other than to note that Kaiser actually reported 0% uh, of prescription drugs covered in covered by rebates. It's much more typical to see around a quarter of the cost of prescription drugs covered by manufacturer rebates. Um, and uh, one thing that uh, that so. Kaiser has very low reported uh, return on rebates. Kaiser actually also does not use a PBM. And the same is true of Providence, even though they are showing rebates that are much more typical. So as we've had a lot of debate about the role of PBMs in the marketplace in the legislature over the last couple of years, that's something to think about is uh, what, what value does actually gets added by the PBMs in the marketplace and pointing to uh, rebates, which will have a lot more information on uh, next year with the new reports. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is taken from aggregated insurer report data. Uh, this is showing the uh, most prescribed prescription drugs for 2022. Uh, most of this is consistent with the things that we've seen over the pre previous years, a lot of stuff showing up that we've seen before. Thyroid agents, uh, Lipitor uh, slash Atorvastatin, which is a cholesterol treatment uh, Adderall and its generics, which are uh, treatments for ADHD, antidepressants, antidiabetic agents, and asthma inhalers, 
Um, the thing that I'm going to call out here is that we did see a big drop in COVID vaccines, that those were actually number one in most prescribed last year, in the previous year, and have dropped down to pretty far down on the list. Um, the most prescribed drug for 2022 was the flu vaccine. And I think what's really interesting here is that you see that, okay, there are uh, a big number of people in our pool, in our sample here, who chose to get a flat flu vaccine, but did not get a COVID vaccine. Um, and I know that's frequently offered as, hey, do you want to do both? So uh, just an interesting observation uh, showing low uptake generally within our sampled population of the COVID vaccine relative to the other sort of regular vaccines like an annual flu vaccine. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is showing the uh, most costly drugs. And so this is representing the drugs which drove the most planned spending. Uh, Sophie had mentioned Humira previously. Uh, there is something that I want to call out uh, that there are a number of sort of analgesic medications which compete with Humira or potential alternatives for sort of all these, this big category of autoimmune disorders like Crohn's disease, which they all treat, Stellara and Brocosentic Skyrizi, which also appear on this list, um, which reflects the very high cost of drugs for those autoimmune disorders across the entire market segment. Um, a couple other things I'll call out, uh, number two, Victarv, which is an antiviral used in uh, pre-exposure pro prophylaxis and post-exposure pro prophylaxis for HIV AIDS, remained on this list with 26 million in claims paid. Keytruda, which is a sort of blockbuster uh, in cancer medication, primarily used for breast cancer treatment, but also used uh, for a number of other cancers. Um, and I, 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 of course, Humira at number one, still 76, uh, 75 million in claims paid for 2022. Um, I, th I think something that's really exciting about Humira right now is that this year, in 2023, there are a number of biosimilar alternatives to Humira. So basically generic versions of Humira, which will come onto market. Uh, we will potentially see if what market impact that has had, if any, next year. Um, so that'll be something to watch out for uh, our hearing next December. Uh, but there have been some anecdotal reports about uh, AbbVie leveraging its market power with other drugs to uh, get PBMs to not prioritize those uh, those generic alternatives. Um, and so we have heard some anecdotal little stories about uh, low uptake for biosimilars so far. Um, at this point, like we don't really know one way or the other, but uh, check back in next year and hopefully I'll be able to tell you more about that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is showing uh, drugs with in the highest increased plan spending. And so the last slide showed total spending. This shows basically the uh, drugs which have the highest increase in spending on the particular drug. A uh, lot of familiar names here from the previous slide. Um, Keytruda, again, blockbuster uh, cancer treatment. Skyrizi, Humira, and Stellara, which I mentioned on the last page, are also here. One other thing that I want to call out, since we do have a discussion of uh, diabetes drugs, which are used for uh, weight loss, is Ozempic, um, which uh, is primarily used as an anti-diabetic agent but has also proven effective as sort of a driver of waste, weight loss. And it is also marketed by its manufacturer under a different brand name, Wagovi. Um, so we don't think that there has been an impact of off-label spending on uh, Ozempic for, uh, for weight loss, uh, because what we've seen in the total number of prescriptions is that has remained quite stable from 2021 to 2022. Uh, which is when sort of the news that this was also something that could drive significant weight loss started to come around. Uh, most insurers are not covering Ozempic off-label as a weight loss. And for that matter, many of them are not covering Wagovi for its on-label prescription as weight loss. Uh, Medica Medicare is actually specifically barred from doing that. So uh, that, that's out there as well. Um, so we think that this 3 million we're seeing here is mostly due to uptake of Ozempic as opposed to other sort of anti-diabetic diabetic, uh, medications for treatment of diabetes, not for weight loss, but just wanted to call that out as well. And there is a significant discussion of those various uh, GLP-1 inhibitors, which are uh, being used for weight loss and or potentially used for weight loss in this year's annual report. So I encourage you to check that out. 
um, as well as, of course, the panel discussion that will be coming up shortly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to finish off by talking about some of our policy recommendations that you'll find in this year's report. Uh, the first two are kind of paired. Uh, we've recommended increased transparency on patient assistance programs um, because right now we receive we we get reports on only a very limited segment of what's actually out there because right now the uh, patient assistance program reports are tethered to price increase reports. Um, so we only get that information for uh, drugs that had that price increase, but like this is a much wider problem. And it's particularly sort of the, the issue with patient assistance is that it often gets offered for new, very high cost drugs, which have just come to market. Uh, and there is the uh, concern uh, that uh, a drug manufacturer could use patient assistance to uh, disincentivize a consumer from switching to a lower cost generic or other alternative that has a lower cost share. Um, so really where we need to collect this data the most is for new high cost drugs, and we don't get any data on uh, prescription drugs for uh, on patient assistance programs for new high cost drugs. We only get it for those price increase reports. So this is something that would really expand our view. Um, the sort of corollary to this, number two, requiring insurers and PBMs to report on their use of copay accumulator programs, just to kind of very briefly explain what that is. This is a form of benefit design where a insurance company will not count the uh, amount paid by third parties like a manufacturer in the form of coupons, et cetera, uh, to, uh, against cost sharing limits. So that would be your copays, your annual out-of-pocket limit, et cetera. Um, and uh, so moving forward, transparency across the supply chain, we have some expanded transparency for PBMs next year, but also we believe that there's room to really uh, try and get to the rest of the boxes in that chart that Sophie showed. So more transparency for PBMs, potentially transparency for uh, insurers in other areas uh, around formularies, for example, transparency related to wholesalers and some of their practices, which are potentially uh, driving higher costs. So that's uh, all of the uh, other uh, usual suspects out there. Uh, next slide, please. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, just a couple more here, uh, recommending studying feasibility of state gener generic manufacturing or expanded bulk, bulk purchasing, kind of looking back to the slide that I showed on uh, the uh, purchasing power uh, between large group and individual plans, kind of what could we do as a state to leverage our purchasing power as a big purchaser of prescription drugs to the various uh, state funded uh, health plans to actually um, use our power to get lower prices for uh, consumers and individuals covered under those plans. Uh, and we've also recommended uh, making some changes to our 60-day advance notice requirement to align the reporting requirement with the, uh, um, mm -mm -mm -mm. to align the reporting requirement with our sort of other price increase reports. Right now, they're slightly different in ways that are potentially confusing. And so just aligning those two reporting requirements would uh, allow for easy, easier um, administration uh, and more consistent administration and easier understanding for our regulated entities in this area. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and that concludes the highlights of the report. Um, I know that I've probably gone over time yet again because I talk a lot, but uh, I, I, I'm happy to answer any questions if Andrew thinks there's time. Thank you very much, Numi, and, and to Sophie as well. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we are a little over time, but if any of our legislator moderators have questions, be happy to uh, allow those for sure. Go right ahead, Senator. Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner Stolfi, and thank you so much, Numi and Sophia. Um, my question is related to um, marketing costs, and I'm wondering if someone is taking a look at what are the mark the equivalent marketing costs for these uh, pharmaceuticals in other countries. I, I know you probably don't have the answer right now, but I would be very interested in that data to see how we compare with other countries on our marketing spends. Yeah, no, that's certainly an interesting question. Um, we have very limited data available about uh, other countries. One of the pieces of information that we do collect as part of our uh, price increase reporting 
is uh, related to so direct costs I showed you, but also we are we collect prices in other countries, and there's supposed to be a list I think of ten up to ten other countries uh, and the prices there. Uh, that has been uh, a portion of the program where we've gotten inconsistent reporting. Uh, so um, I, I I don't have a ton to share there. Um, I, I would point you back to the 2019 report, which uh, uh, we did actually have some data presented in that first report that we put out that was uh, basically showing that there were much lower prices in other countries. Um, but as far as, you know, we know that there are bans in most other countries on the sort of direct to consumer TV advertising for prescription drugs. So I imagine that has an impact, but that's not something that we've collected any data on historically but definitely something we could look into in the future. And if I could just follow up related to that is related to the profit data uh, and pricing fa factors being trade secrets. I'm wondering also, I'd like to ask, I know it, I don't expect an answer right now, but if other states are have different approaches to that information, um, I can understand the trade secrets of the formula, formulation of pharmaceuticals and the research and development, but, um, Profit data seems a little trouble, a little confusing to me. Yeah, no, that I appreciate the question, Senator. Um, I I think one thing that is notable about our program in Oregon is that we collect more data than pretty much any other state that has a drug price transparency program. We were one of the first, and we also collect the most data elements. Uh, and in addition to that, we actually have are are empowered to review trade secret claims and determine whether or not. They are trade secret, in fact. Uh, so for things like what you're mentioning, there are a lot of instances where, okay, we would challenge that and say, no, we don't think that's actually a trade secret. Uh, I, I mean, profit and uh, direct costs. Uh, I, in practice, we found that that information isn't actually published anywhere in a lot of cases. And so like, like it meets the definition of trade secret. Should it? I, I, I mean, uh, I, I think that's a policy question that's above my pay grade. Um, but, you, you know, just put that out there, like, uh, I, I, I mean, there's been questionable trade secret claims that have been submitted to us, and we have been putting some energy into challenging those assertions. Um, I, we are at least able to report some of that data, as you saw in the slides, and you see in the report, if you review it, uh, that we're able to at least report that out in aggregated form, so we can have some insights into a market-wide perspective. But uh, that's maybe not as precise as we would like it to be sometimes. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question, Senator. Representative Goodwin. Hi, thank you, Numi. Good to see you. Yes, you and I have worked together closely on scrutiny of um, pharmacy benefit managers. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that the reporting that will come out will create more transparency in uh, their role in this complex drug supply chain and just how much value that they actually add in terms of reducing consumer uh, drug prices. So I know there's lots of questions in here and we'll continue to work those through as we work. I know I'm working with Rep Nathanson now on 3013 and we're trying to achieve oversight because at this point it doesn't appear as though the PBMs really have a whole lot of oversight. But on the rebate question of this 25%, is there any evidence that they actually, any of that rebate that they negotiate with pharma is really passed along in terms of drug savings to the consumer? Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Representative. Um, it, what, what insurers will most often tell you is that um, savings based on rebates are passed on to the consumer in the form of reduced premiums. Um, and you know, we, uh, to, to the best of our knowledge, that is true. And that is because of the medical loss ratio that insurers are restricted from uh, spending uh, more than 80% of spending less than 80% of their premium collected on medical claims. So at least for the insurers, we know that, okay, most of that is actually going to benefit consumers. Um, you know, we don't have the same sort of protection with respect to PBMs. Uh, so uh, what happens within the PBM black box doesn't necessarily reflect that sort of pass through uh, as that ultimately goes. Um, I, I think the other thing 
that all note with respect to rebate pass through. Okay, so there is difficulty in trying to to say that does a rebate benefit the particular consumer that has the particular drug? No, it does not right now under our current system. Okay. Uh, it, to the extent that it benefits consumers, it is across the board, it goes into the premium and so potentially lowers premiums for everybody, but isn't benefiting the particular consumer as the particular high cost drug. Um, what we are going to have in next year's report is we will have numbers reported to us specifically on the amount that is passed through to consumers, the amount that is passed through by the PBM to the insurer. Uh, and so we'll have uh, a, a sort of better picture on what happens within the PBM in terms of what gets passed through. And so like, I think that'll be informative, but uh, it'll be our first year of reporting and we'll, we'll, we'll certainly see. And good to see you as the WELP representative. Uh, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, not seeing any other questions, last chance. All right. Uh, Thank you very much for the presentation. We're, we're going to move on now to our first public comment period. We have uh, two people signed up right now. We, of course, have time after our two presentations. Uh, so please do sign up in the chat if you'd like to uh, submit some public testimony. We're going to have first Andrew Mayer with AARP, followed by Carissa Kemp of the American Diabetes Association. Uh, you can hear me. I don't know why you can't see yes. me with apologies. I have my camera off. Um, and so I, I am present, but I guess you'll look at the broad screen. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Senator and Representatives, Andrea Meyer, Director of Government Relations from ARP Oregon. I'm, I'm pleased to be here again this year. And on behalf of over our half a million members here in Oregon, we advocate for Oregonians 50 plus on a broad range of issues, including on prescription drug price reforms. Last year, we were successful with our advocacy at the federal level, and now Medicare has the authority to negotiate drug prices. However, those reforms are limited, and there remains much more we can do at the state level as well. The reality is Americans are sick and tired of paying the highest drug prices in the world for critically needed medications. We pay three times more than other countries for the same brand drugs. And the prices of prescription drugs are growing rapidly. I think you saw that today. A recent report by the Department of Health and Human Services noted that list prices on more than 1,900 prescription drugs rose faster than inflation between January 2022 and January 2023. ARP's Public Policy Institute, our most recent RX Price Watch report, found that in 2020, prices for 180 widely used specialty prescription drugs increased by more than three and a half times faster than the general inflation in 2020. This is an ongoing problem. It unnecessarily increases healthcare spending takes money out of consumer pockets and leads to increased government spending. Oregonians should not have to choose between buying medicine and paying for food and rent, but the reality is faced by too many. In Oregon, the annual cost of prescription drug treatment increased almost 20% between 2016 and 2020, while the annual income for Oregon residents only increased by 13.4%. So I will give one example. In 2021, almost half a million Oregonians had been diagnosed with cancer. Revlimid is a cancer drug that may help many of these individuals. Between 2015 and 2020, the price of that drug went from over $187,000 to $267,000 per year. And since it was launched in 2005, its list price has gone up 270% while the corresponding rate of general inflation for that period was 53%. And that means it's basically increased by four times the rate of inflation. In Oregon, I'm pleased we have made important advances to bring transparency to the reasons for drug price increases, such as this hearing and this whole um, program. But we must go further to enact meaningful reforms in Oregon that will make the difference in our lives. And what does that look like? Well, Oregon should empower the Prescription Drug Affordability Board, the PDAB, to set upper payment limits on certain high-priced drugs utilizing data that's connect, 
collected by the existing transparency law. And we believe it should be applied to all payers in the state, but even if only applied to government payers, it would reduce drug spending by government considerably. And we certainly look forward to um, the work the PDAB is doing in that effort and being part of the conversation next year. Maine law requires the state to publish a list online of what the state could save if they use this system. So in 2023, their first report indicated that if a state set an upper payment limit based on Canadian prices on 72 identified drugs, Mainers could save over 146 million annually. International reference pricing using Canadian prices as a reference point to establish UPLs on drugs that the PDAD determines are overpriced is one method the ARP supports to rein in drug spending. Another method would be to use negotiated rate on drugs that Medicare establishes, known as a maximum fair price. This would effectively reduce state spending and if applied to all payers could lead to lower healthcare premiums and out of pocket price costs for all Oregonians. Finally, we support expanding bulk purchasing efforts, banning price gouging by drug manufacturers, making it easier for pharmacists to substitute biosimilar drugs for biologic drugs, and preventing insurance companies from changing their formularies in the middle of the plan year that cause an increase of out-of-pocket costs or other negative effects for consumers. I have provided my testimony in writing and we do appreciate the opportunity to provide our comments here today. We stand ready to join others in addressing the high cost of prescription drugs so our members no longer have to make those tough decisions about whether or not they can afford the medications they need. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony. So we're gonna go next to Carissa. Hi everyone, my name is Carissa Kemp and I'm the Director of State Government Affairs for the American Diabetes Association. Thank you for the opportunity to share our perspective on the first panel topic today. The ADA's mission is to prevent and cure diabetes and to improve the lives of all people affected by diabetes. Critical to that work is prevention, which is why the ADA strongly supports providing comprehensive access to the evidence-based interventions to treat and manage the chronic disease of obesity in accordance with the ADA's clinical standards of care. These interventions include intensive lifestyle modification counseling, anti-obesity medications, and bariatric metabolic surgery as recommended by a health professional. We've worked extensively to ensure people have access to the medication that they need to manage their disease. And while I'm not here today to speak in favor of not approved use of these medications, we do have concerns with the framing of this discussion and the narrative of the panel today, which pits two chronic diseases, diabetes and obesity against each other. The approach also highlights a stigma and bias towards the chronic disease of obesity. It focuses on cost and rationing rather than on leveraging and deploying proven effective interventions to prevent diabetes, treat and manage obesity, reduce cardiovascular risk factors, and put diabetes in remission if acquired. There's a growing up obesity epidemic in Oregon and across the nation, which disproportionately impacts communities of color. Diabetes rates in Oregon are on a similar troubling trend. According to the Oregon Public Health Division, obesity is the second leading cause of preventable death in the state, causing an estimated 1,500 deaths each year. In 2017, 29% of Oregon adults had obesity. Black and African Americans are at 35.8%, American Indians and Alaska Natives are at 40.6%, and Hispanics are at 27% more likely to have obesity than white people. Children in Oregon are having a similar experience to adults. Between 2001 and 2017, obesity increased by 56% among eighth graders. Obesity is a complex, multifactorial, and costly chronic disease that serves as a major risk factor for developing conditions such as heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, as I've already mentioned, renal disease, and 12 types of obesity-related cancer. The health benefits of effective weight management have been extensively and consistently documented. The ADA's 2023 standards of care review the evidence and demonstrate that obesity management can delay the progression from prediabetes to type 2. Rather than pitting these two chronic diseases against each other, we should seize this opportunity to ensure patients and providers have access to evidence-based interventions to both treat diabetes and prevent diabetes. The estimated economic burden attributable to overweight and obesity in the U.S. was $480.7 billion in direct health care costs. And our recent report, which came out of the American Diabetes Association, found that in 2022, the total annual cost of diabetes was $412.9 billion. We should be looking at evidence that shows a link between treating obesity 
the associated health benefits and improvements, and ultimately reduction in total health care costs. Health improvements can reduce the total annual health care costs of an individual, particularly for individuals with more than one chronic disease. A particular study found that an individual with a sustained weight reduction of 5% or 12% for two years is estimated to result in direct medical savings of about just shy of 16,000 or about 26 and a half thousand respectively per patient over 15 years. As with diabetes, individuals with obesity deserve access to evidence-based treatment that can help them improve their health and ultimately drive down healthcare costs. In order to achieve our mission at the ADA, we of ending diabetes, we have to recognize that we must also address and effectively manage obesity. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much, Krista. All right, we're going to move on now to our first panel discussion. This is on the impact of diabetic drugs approved for weight loss. We have several presenters. We're going to hear from each of them, and then we'll have an opportunity for a little Q&A with the moderator panel. We're going to start first with Dr. David Rind. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm David Rind. I'm a primary care doctor in Boston. I treat diabetes and obesity, and I use the drugs we're talking about, and I'm also the Chief Medical Officer of the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So uh, just quickly on ICER, ICER was started as an ethics and evidence policy research program, and since 2013 has been an independent health technology assessment group that develops publicly available value assessment reports and uses cost-effectiveness analysis to do, determine and suggest value-based price benchmarks for new drugs. ICER tries to time its reviews to complete around FDA approval so as to influence price negotiations. Next slide, please. Uh, obesity is common chronic disease. It increases risk for diabetes, high blood pressure, arthritis, cancer, heart disease, and death. More than 40% of adults in the U.S. have obesity, and that's projected to reach 50% by 2030. Obesity is even more common in certain groups, and U.S. medical costs attributable to obesity is estimated to be about $260 billion annually, noting that you're hearing different estimates today. Uh, next slide, please. Here are the medications we're talking about. Um, the first three there are GLP-1s. The fourth is a GLP-1 GIP receptor agonist. Uh, all but dilaglutide at this point have some indication for obesity. Liraglutide um, reduces weight perhaps a bit. Dulaglutide, even though it doesn't have a weight loss form, uh, maybe a little bit better than liraglutide. The drugs that we really care about at this point are semaglutide, particularly in its WEGAV dosing form, um, where it reduces weight a lot, and we'll go through that, and trizepatide, uh, where Munjaro and the new brand Zepbound, which is the weight loss version, are the same dosing for diabetes and obesity and have a lot of weight loss. Next slide, please. This is a study of semaglutide published in the New England Journal showing what happens over 68 weeks. Uh, you can see that people on placebo lost about 3% of their body weight, whereas people on semaglutide lost about 17% of their body weight, which is a lot of weight loss. Next slide, please. This is trizepatide. Uh, this is Munjaro or Zepbound under its new brand name. Uh, again, with about 3% weight loss at 72 weeks for placebo and about 21% weight loss um, at that same time frame with trizepatide. Next slide, please. Looking at this in terms of weight loss percentage targets, more than slightly more than half of patients on semaglutide lost 15% or more of their body weight, and almost a third lost 20% or more of their body weight. We're talking about very substantial weight loss. Next slide. With the highest dose of terzepatide, you're seeing more than half of patients losing 20% of their weight loss and more than a third losing 25% of their weight um, at the highest dose. Again, these are dramatic weight losses, some of them in the range of what you see with some surgical procedures. Next slide, please. Weight loss is only maintained while therapy is maintained. These are not drugs to lose weight, come off, and hope that you can keep the weight off. 
This shows what happened in that 68-week trial after the drug was stopped. Within about a year, much of the weight, 80% or so, had returned, and the expectation is that all the weight will return if you stay off the drug. Next slide, please. Uh, these drugs also have cardiovascular benefits. Uh, we certainly know that about the GLP-1 receptor agonists, which have been being used to treat uh, type 2 diabetes, where they reduce cardiovascular risk. We have years of data in this space. Uh, semaglutide has been studied in patients with coronary artery disease and obesity, and it reduced a composite of cardiovascular events by 20% and had a 19% reduction in all-cause mortality, which is on the same order of what you see with statin therapy. This is a very big reduction. Uh, with terzepatide, Munjaro, uh, Zepbound, we don't yet have any cardiovascular outcomes trial data, even in diabetes. But in earlier studies, it looked like the numbers will probably be similar to those with semaglutide. Uh, data are expected out late next year. Next slide, please. Uh, there have certainly been shortages. Semaglutide has been difficult in pretty much all its forms for patients to obtain, both as Ozempic, its diabetes form, to some extent with Rebelsis, the oral form, and certainly with Wegovy, the weight loss form. And the same could now occur with Trisapatide now that uh, it has a weight loss indication. Uh, switching over to my anecdotal experience rather than speaking in research from uh, ICER, uh, dilaglutide, another GLP-1 that is a very good uh, drug for diabetes, has been widely available, and there are still other GLP-1 options. So even if there are shortages of drugs like semaglutide for diabetes, there aren't really shortages of GLP-1s overall for diabetes. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of a fair price, ICER analyses suggest that their net prices Terzepatide and semaglutide are probably both cost-effective for weight loss. This assumes that you can get semaglutide for under $9,000 a year as a weight loss drug. We see different estimates about what's happening there. Terzepatide um, clearly is being sold at least as Munjaro, well below the prices where it is cost-effective. Next slide, please. Despite that fact that it is cost-effective, that does not help you a lot with the budget impact. At the list price of semaglutide, you could treat 0.1% of eligible patients by our estimate within five years without having major budget constraints. That's not 1%, that's one in a thousand. And remember, 40% of US adults have obesity and many of them want treatment. At the lower end of our fair price range, you could still only treat 0.26% within five years without major budget constraints. Next slide, please. So you may need to think about strategies to control budget impact. However, there are problems with these. For instance, one thing we've seen people do is try to restrict to very high BMI patients, like over 40, but that will miss the benefits, including the cardiovascular benefits and many other benefits that can be seen in many patients. Obesity is a broad problem, not just at the high end, and not just at that end are you seeing medical complications. Another thing we've seen people do is require lifestyle management. Um, there's actually relatively little evidence that this is needed. The studies generally did include lifestyle management, but it made no difference whether there was intensive lifestyle management or regular lifestyle management in terms of how well um, semaglutide, for instance, worked for weight loss. And then a third method we've seen is what sometimes gets called the Netflix model. This has been tried at least once with uh, hepatitis C drugs of paying a single price to the manufacturers with an agreement that you can treat as many patients as you want for that single price per year. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, the vast majority of patients cannot achieve long-term weight loss with diet and exercise alone. These new medications work. They work for obesity, they work for diabetes, and they reduce other risks like cardiovascular risks. Um, if terzepatide has the same cardiovascular benefits as semaglutide, you should anticipate that it may well take over from semaglutide as the weight loss drug, given that it has higher weight loss. There are other drugs coming down the pike. Even at fair prices, by our calculations, the budget impact will be enormous 
to anyone who is trying to cover these drugs, and you may want to consider other payment models. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rind. And uh, as a reminder, we'll, we'll have time for some questions for this whole panel after the end. Uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown. Thanks, Director Stofi. We appreciate the opportunity to be here in the space. Uh, thank you for the invite, uh, Ms. Sophie Parra, and of course to Ms. Veronica Murray. Uh, thank you. It's good to be in the space. Uh, one of the things that I would like to share with you, not only in my daytime role, I work as a policy advisor for DHS, and also I do some policy advising for other elected officials throughout the state of Oregon. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a, just a conversation about obesity race, and of course, our socioeconomic status. Next slide, please, Melissa. When you think about having a conversation about obesity, obesity is an epidemic. It's not something we thought about last week or last year. It's an epidemic that's been happening for a while. When I take a look at the experts, and there are several experts in this space, you've already heard from several experts today, when I think about what's it going to take to have an inclusive conversation, a conversation that can make things happen, I tend to follow off one of our experts here. I think about Dr. Stanford. This is what she says, and it blows my mind away. Let's have a conversation about what's killing us every day. When she's treating her patients, she's treating them for heart disease, cancer, and the many other types of diseases that all stem from obesity. It's an epidemic in our country and is not disappearing any time soon. So can we have a courageous conversation about it? How do we sit down at the table and invite those particular people in offices to the table to have a conversation? Next slide, please. When I think back over this past year in partnership uh, with Senator Wyden's office, and also when I think about the Health Equity Coalition for Chronic Disease, our partnership matters. So they invited us to the table, the NAACP. We are in this conversation. We are at the front leading the charge. Because why? We need to have a courageous conversation, not only about obesity, but also looking at the data and race, it is all interconnected together. You can't have one without the other. And when I think about the data, the data speaks for itself. When we think about the lives that were lost during COVID, if one of those families would have had the necessary and the needed medication, it could have prevented a death. It could have prevented multiple deaths. But in this country, we have an obesity problem. It's an epidemic. And you just heard from Dr. Rand that over 40% of Americans today are living with obesity. And 60 and older, they live with it. Meaning day in and day out, there are gonna be some struggles when it comes to living with this disease. Next slide, please. And race matters. When you go to CDC's website, what they will put on their website, they will say this, and I quote, we have disaggregated the data by race, ethnicity, and location. CDC believes that race has a direct correlation with obesity. I believe that as well. When I think about being a Black African American, I know that there are several people, not only within my own family, but in my neighborhood, that are struggling with obesity. So if we're gonna have a courageous conversation about it, we have to find a way to say, hey, who is not represented at this table? Take a look around, who's missing? How do we have a conversation that can move and impact policy? Next slide, please. Income, income, and educational levels. Uh, Maya Angelou, she said it perfectly. Uh, she said that when you know better, you do better. Meaning education matters. So when I think about 
the educational level that some people have, if they do not have the right education, thorough education on how to teach them how to live better, how to be have better eating habits, living habits, when it comes to living well, if they don't have that knowledge, the individual cannot do better. So I allow the data and the race to speak for itself because why? We know that there is a complexity of concerns and problems that come from this particular epidemic. Next slide, please. Diseases. Diseases. Take a look at that word. Diseases associated with obesity, such as heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and other types of cancer, it is all preventable, meaning we have the solutions, meaning we know how to fix this problem. But why? Why does the problem continue to go on year after year? Why do we continue to have policies that are not only outdated, but are discriminatory in practices? It leaves people out. Access. When you think about access, who is not getting these drugs? Who's not getting the help and support that they need? If you ask the question about access, you must now ask the question, who is the gatekeeper? What does the gatekeeper look like? Where does the gatekeeper live? When I think about coming into this particular space, you could look at me and tell that I was a Black African American. You have no knowledge of my income. You have no knowledge of where I live. You have no knowledge of how much money I have in the bank. But the one thing that you could determine by looking at me today was I was a Black man. So when I think about race and I think about access, we have to ask ourselves, why are so many Americans do not have access to the help that they need? It is because there are policies in place, policies in place that people put there on purpose. Next slide. I realize that today there are gonna be some things that people hear that may rub them the wrong way, that may have them ask themselves, hmm, let's have a conversation about it. Let's talk about this. In my closing, here is the million dollar question that I think we have to ask ourselves. Does Medicare include this particular FDA-approved anti-obesity medications, also known as AOMs, and their Medicare Part D coverage? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. Well, the answer is no. You just saw on one slide in the previous presenter that roughly over $250 billion annually is being spent. We spend it, but are we saving lives? And I'm here today to remind us that we gotta be sure that we create partnerships, not only with our legislators, not only with our school districts, but also with people. We have to bring back discourse, discourse that we can sit down and have a conversation. I like to call it cultural humility. What's it gonna take for us to invite people into the space that have been traditionally and historically forgotten. Can we do that? Next slide. Let's keep the conversation going. When I think about the data, when I think about the lives that we could prevent from being lost this year, our plea is this and our plea is simple. Make sure that you have a conversation with your legislator. Make sure you have a conversation with someone, not only in your school district, but someone in your family. If you know that they are struggling with obesity, it may be a touchy conversation to have, but it's a necessary conversation to have. And I am encouraged today to listen not only to the people on this particular panel, but we gotta listen to our past so we do not create the same mistake tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. Uh, next up, uh, we've got two more presenters, then we'll have some questions. Next up, we have Mihir Patel. Over to you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Stolfi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mihir Patel, Chief Pharmacy Officer at Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oregon. Next slide, please. 
So starting off the GLP-1 landscape, I know some of this information was presented a little bit earlier by Dr. Rind, but I just wanted to point out here that you know, we have about 10 brand name medications on the market right now. When you look at the ones that have been approved for weight management, the pricing for those are substantially higher than the other GLP-1s. Um, next slide, please. So with our current state at Regents, uh, we do require pre-authorization for GLP-1s uh, for diabetes. Um, it, it's consistent with our benefit plans. And GLP-1 drugs for weight management are benefit excluded from most of our plans. However, self-funded plans have an option to cover or adopt the benefit exclusion for weight management uh, based on their own needs. Uh, as we have seen uh, most recently in a study that was published earlier this year, um, some side effects are associated with GLP-1s. As we are seeing more and more utilization, some more of those side effects are showing up. And only about 27% of the patients have remained adherent on therapy after one year. So we continue to assess for sustainable opportunities for coverage in weight management space. Uh, to date, the differential pricing, as I showed before, for these agents, specifically for the obesity, remain the primary barrier to coverage. As stewards of our, our clients' finances and stewards of the premium dollar, we recognize the needs to address uh, cost trends. Next slide, please. So here we have our utilization trend over the past year or so. Uh, and as you can see, the guidelines were updated in January of this year, and we've seen a substantial increase in utilization of GLP-1s, um, rightfully so, because they have been approved and indicated for first-line use in diabetes. Um, as you can see, though, the, the utilization has increased uh, more than twice of what we've seen in the past year, from October 2022, for example, to October 2023. And some of that utilization we do know is uh, used for uh, weight loss. And so we did implement a prior authorization as I indicated before, uh, which went into effect uh, just a month ago. Uh, next slide. And so it really comes down to value and affordability. Uh, as we've heard, you know, there's extensive comorbidity and relative risk reduction with these agents. Um, they're highly efficacious and, and mostly well tolerated. And there's a high prevalence of obesity and diabetes and it requires lifetime use. And unfortunately, these have a very high list price. So as ICER has shown before, um, you know, they've concluded that GLP-1 agonists should be discounted 45% or more to be considered cost effective. And current pricing unfortunately stifles coverage opportunities and impacts accessibility for some of these agents. That's shown before, again, down there on the bottom, uh, the annual risk list price are $17,000 for Wagobi, over $17,000 for Sixenda, and over $13,000 for Zepbound. So the ISO thresholds, as shown there, are uh, much lower than that, about half of that. What's fortunate is that we are going to see some more products come out to market, and that will hopefully bring some of the prices down. And as competition increases, the manufacturers hopefully will see an opportunity to uh, bring some more competition into the market around pricing. Uh, next slide. And I'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. We've got one more presenter, and then we're going to definitely get to questions. So let's jump right to our last presenter of Charlie Fisher. Charlie, over to you. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me. And I would just say an honor to be on this uh, virtual stage with uh, several esteemed folks. Um, and uh, to introduce myself, I'm Charlie Fisher. I'm the state director at OSPERG. We're a statewide member-funded public interest organization. Um, and I mean, I think the information we just heard is really interesting. And, and from our perspective, uh, this is just one example of the broader problem that drug prices are higher than they should be. And these often unjustifiably high prices cause serious affordability challenges for many Oregonians. Uh, the uh, tra price transparency report that came out, uh, I, there's a good statistic in there that found that 28% of Oregon Oregonians said it was difficult to afford their prescription drugs. And our own research found that about one in five Oregonians uh, either didn't take a prescribed drug or skip doses due to cost. So I mentioned that upfront just to say that I think this is a microcosm of the larger problem that we're seeing both in Oregon and across the country. Now, given the emerging evidence of the, the positive impacts that we've heard of 
um, these drugs on long-term health and uh, I guess coupled with the potential amount of people who would benefit from the drug, it's important to consider the impact of its price. Um, so just to underscore that point, a uh, Kaiser Family Foundation analysis found that the, the list price for a month's supply of Wigovi in the US is uh, $1,349 versus $328 in Germany and $296 in the Netherlands. And this is true for um, other drugs in this class like Ozempic um, and several others. So clearly it appears there is evidence that manufacturers could charge less in the US but choose not to simply because they can. Um, and we know this is the case for multiple high cost drugs. Now, while we would hope that competition will hopefully bring down costs over time, there is also uh, evidence and precedent for brand name drugs still under patent protection increasing in price over the years. Um, an AARP analysis found that list prices for the top 25 Medicare Part D drugs have increased by an average of 226% or more than triple since they first entered the market. Now, finally, I wanna highlight how these drugs are, I think a good example of various patent abuse tactics uh, used by pharmaceutical manufacturers. So one in particular uh, is something called a patent thicket. A patent thicket is created when a drug company strategically applies for and amasses uh, a multitude of approved patents on a single drug, essentially wrapping their drug in so many patents that no competitor could ever challenge them all successfully. Um, for a generic drug competitor to be able to sell its lower priced version of a drug to patents, it must show that the brand name drug company's existing patents are invalid or don't apply to their medication. And the patents can be challenged either at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office or in federal court, but it takes years and millions of dollars to, to challenge this patent thicket. So um, for drugs in uh, uh, the GLP-1 category, a uh, paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association, Association in July found that brand name manufacturers obtained a median of 19.5 patents per drug and secured a median of 18.3 years of expected protection. I think especially importantly is that more than half of all of these patents were obtained on the delivery devices rather than active ingredients. There recently have also been challenges to some of the patents for Wegovi, which further suggests that brand name manufacturers are taking advantage of the patent system to prevent competition and lower prices. So to conclude, once again, I think these drugs are another example of the importance of both uh, Oregon's drug price transparency program and especially our prescription drug affordability board. Now, while obviously the state uh, uh, can't address the underlying patent issues, uh, an area of progress that can be made is giving the prescription drug affordability board authority to set an upper payment limit on high cost drugs and drugs that pose affordability challenges for Oregonians. So uh, I, I'm hopeful that we'll see action on that in the future, but uh, in the meantime, I'm glad that the transparency provided by hearings like this can shine a light, shine a light on um, the problem of high drug prices. So thanks so much for uh, having me. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, uh, Charlie. We'll ask our analysts and moderators to all uh, turn their cameras back on if you're able, and we'll open it up now to see if any of our moderators have questions for our first panel. I see Senator Patterson, your hands up. Go right ahead. Um, thank you so much, Commissioner Listolfi, and thank you so much to all of our presenters. This was, is extremely um, informative and helpful. Um, uh, I just wanted to note, um, thank you particularly for the data that shows that the cost needs to come down about 45% to be cost effective. Um, and I'd like to um, thank um, uh, Charlie for bringing the data from other countries that shows that it's in the low hundreds rather than in the um, mid 
um, teens of thousands. Um, I would also like to ask um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Patel if, from Regents, if he would reiterate if I've understood correctly, did you say that only 27% of patients remain on GLP-1s after a year because of side effects, or did I misunderstand that? Yeah, that, that's correct. That was uh, actually a study done by Prime Therapeutics that was released, uh, I believe, in July of this year, where they looked at patients on the GLP-1s specifically for, for weight loss. And it looks like uh, only about 27% of patients were actually on the drug um, after, in, in a one-year time frame. Thank you so much. I, I'd just like to flag that for all of us as we look to um, whether or not things should be um, considered. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Brown for um, meant for talking about the equity issues related to health inequities and certainly access to drugs that are um, uh, needed and helpful are, are extremely important. So thank you. And thank you for this presentation. Thank you, Senator. Let's see if there are any more questions. I do see you, your hand, Dr. Rand. I want to see if there are any more questions from the moderators. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Rin, did you have something to share? I, I just wanted to comment on that 27% number because we've heard that a lot. Um, a thing to remember is exactly the issue that you've brought this panel together for, which is the shortages. Um, I prescribe a lot of these drugs. Most of the discontinuations I've seen have occurred when patients were unable to move to the next dose of the drug because it was unavailable, uh, particularly with semaglutide and recognizing that they couldn't get the next dose and weren't losing weight on the low dose they were on, chose to discontinue and say, I'll go back on it when higher doses are back available. So that 27% number is a tricky number in this situation of shortage. Charlie, go right ahead. Oh yeah, I would just, that I guess prompted for me the, the thought that um, in addition to that, we know that uh, people often stop taking their prescriptions because of cost. So um, I wouldn't be surprised to hear that part of that come, that number comes from that as well. Thanks for that. Any, any other questions from our moderators for this panel? Uh, Dr. Stopi, I just want one final comment. Yeah. Uh, and Senator Patton, she uh, she said this, and she and I have had a variety of conversations in the past uh, on all different subjects. Uh, it is about equity. Uh, one of the things that we do not talk enough about is the correlation between obesity and race. We tend to look at one of those and not the other. And so that that's an unfair practice. Uh, because you can look at me, I cannot separate my race from, from part of my identity. And so when we look at people that are struggling with obesity, and we look at the data, we know that there are some states geographically who have a higher prevalent struggle when it comes to obesity. My home state, Louisiana, is one of them. Louisiana, Oklahoma, they have over 40% of this obesity, it's an epidemic, of their population. And so my encouragement to us experts is that we got to really find a way to invite everyone to the table, especially for those communities that are being affected at a higher rate. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And, and thank you to all the members of this panel. Very much appreciate your presentations, your thoughts, and your comments. So we're going to move now to our second and last panel presentation. This is on what determines the cost of a generic and why are many so expensive? And again, we have a, a few presenters who will go through after which we will have a little Q&A period. Uh, and then just a reminder after that, we will have our last public comment period. We do have a, a number of people signed up for that already. If anyone else is interested, uh, please sign in as well. So first, we're going to have Michael Sargent. Mr. Sargent, over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, my name is Michael Sargent. I'm Senior Policy Director at the Association for Accessible Medicines. And AEM represents um, the manufacturers of finished generic product and biosimilar products, as well as the manufacturers of unfinished and active ingredient products. Um, so very, ple very pleased to be here today. Um, so overall, <clears throat> one of the, oh, next slide please, thank you. 
So this is basically our top line. And much of this data was taken from our 2023 savings report, which was just published in September. And we've historically updated this every year, um, generated from Acuvia national sales data. But I think the key things to stress here is that um, generics and biosimilars represent across the country, across all payer segments, roughly 90% of what's dispensed throughout the country. So I think in active pharmacy terms, that's referred to as the generic dispensing rate. Um, can everybody see me? Um, I just, my video just cut out. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. So, um, so generic dispensing rate of 90%. Um, and despite the fact that generics and bio or biosimilars represent 90% of what's dispensed, we only account for generic medicines and biosimilars only account for roughly 17 and a half percent of the national prescription drug spend. So by getting to that, um, by getting to that GDR, um, generics and biosimilars have generated $194 billion in savings in 2022 in the commercial marketplace and $130 billion in savings in Medicare Part D. The other thing that we strike, like to stress um, in this initial slide is just the average generic copay uh, is $6.16, where the average brand copay is $56. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide just illustrates what I was talking about relative to overall savings. Um, so when we talk about combined savings of roughly um, $400 billion in 2022, I think you can see the escalation of the savings amount nearly doubled um, over this 10 year stretch, um, You know, really kind of hitting the $400 billion mark uh, in 2022. Um, we continue to see you know, aggressive adoption of generics in the marketplace. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about some of the impediments that we see at the plan and the PBM level relative to co-pays co and cost sharing. But generally speaking, generics and biosimilars offer a great deal of savings across multiple payer segments. Next slide, please. Um, this slide, again, this just illustrates um, a lot of the data that we, we listed on the initial slide. And the key point to make here is just around the GDR. You know, we've seen aggressive generic dispensing rates um, really since 2012 with 84% in 2012 and really hitting the 90% mark in late 2018, 2019. And we've hovered around the 90% mark throughout the last three years. Next slide. So, you know, one of the issues that comes up with respect to uh, generic drugs and biosimilars is just the idea of, you know, cost and cost to whom. And one of the thing that, things that we stress is just that, you know, the generic, the price that the generic manufacturer or the biosimilar manufacturer charges the wholesaler or the acquiring pharmacy is only one part of the equation. We've really got to think in terms of what are the cost to patients in terms of co-pays and out-of-pocket costs. And one of the things that we've seen, um, um, if we compare performance and the commercial marketplace versus Medicare Part D is that over time, um, the commercial marketplace has been very aggressive in terms of adopting um, coverage of new generics on formularies. So if we look at 2016, you know, we see in the commercial marketplace, roughly a 46% coverage rate of generics that were launched in 2016 and ultimately getting up to about 90% today. And in Medicare Part D, there was a 22% coverage rate in 2016 and only escalating to 61% today. Um, so part of our strategy has tried to, or has been um, geared around really trying to promote Medicare Part D to, um, to be as aggressive as commercial plants have been in the adoption of generic medications and biosimilars. Next slide. And this is just a, uh, a key slide because coverage is, is one part of the equation, but tiering is also another big part of this. And when we talk about plan design and um, PBM tiering of generics and biosimilars, um, you know, one of the one of the real issues for us is looking at the fact that, um, especially in the Medicare Part D program, we've had a 21% increase in volume um, in terms of generic utilization. And that is illustrated um, if you look at the data between 2011 and 2019, um, and 
And this slide showing a 30% throughout that period of time into 2019, 30% reduction in costs. And yet we saw 135% increase in, um, in patient uh, out-of-pocket costs related to the utilization of generics. And, and so a big part of this and a big part of what we're trying to advocate for in AEM is the continued placement of generic medications and biosimilars on lower cost generic tiers um, that favors lower costs, lower out-of-pocket costs, lower copays, et cetera. In our view, this is a real key part of you know, driving not only sustainability for these medicines, but driving um, lower costs for patients in every payer sector. Next slide. And that's it. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna uh, go through, we've got a few more presenters and then we'll absolutely have some questions. And next we're going to Daria McGrew, over to you. Hi, thank you, Commissioner uh, Stolfi, members and uh, members of the committee. Daria McGrew, thank, on behalf of Pharma, Director of State Policy. Thank you for the invitation to speak here today. Next slide, please. Um, in uh, Pharma represents the country's leading innovative biopharmaceutical research companies. Um, in for the purposes of today's presentation, that that keyword there is innovative. Um, so before a drug can be a generic, it has to be a new drug on the market, and that means um, these are the companies that discover. Uh, invest and bring to, bring to market the new drugs so that they can become the generics of tomorrow. Next slide, please. So I'm going to uh, review for you a little bit of what it takes to bring a new drug to market. Um, it takes about between 10 and 15 years and costs on average $2.6 billion. And it's a very high failure industry. There's a lot of different types of research, um, clinical, laboratory, et cetera, um, and about 90% failure in, in of drugs entering the pipeline, not making it to, uh, to FDA approval. So for the investors and the companies, this is a high risk, financially high risk um, industry. Uh, next slide, please. The innovation, whoops, it skipped a slide. Uh, is there a slide before that? Innovation, I'll, I'll, one of my slides disappeared. That's okay. I was just going to um, let you know that innovation does not end um, at FDA approval. Uh, drugs continue to uh, to be iterated upon year after year for for many many years after FDA approval. They might um, be shown to to be effective in additional uh, pa patient populations or for additional indications like other types of cancers if it's a cancer drug. And so the, the innovation, iteration, and uh, financial investment does not end at FDA approval. Cool, next slide, please. Um, the, uh, I want to, to uh, compare and contrast the um, private sector investment with public sector investment, just so that you can see kind of the scale of the finance, uh, financial impact that we're talking about here. The, the biopharmaceutical industry in the United States invested in 2020, $122 billion. Uh, and that's just for drug development. Uh, in comparison, the NIH budget for the same year was $43 billion, less than 10% of that went to drug discovery. Most of our public uh, investment in research goes to basic research, which is absolutely critical and complementary to the work done by the private sector, but it is not um, cannot be supplanted. And uh, this kind of just goes to show that the public sector is not set up for the scale or the risk. It would be um, you know, an inappropriate use of public funds to take on this kind of risk that the private sector does. Next slide, please. The, um, what allows companies to do that in the United States and has propelled us to be the leading um, developer, uh, inventor of new drugs in the whole entire world um, is our unique intellectual property system. The intellectual property system is carefully balanced public policy that balances uh, incentivizing the private sector manufacturers and investors to take on that high risk by giving them a certain amount of time where um, they can have a chance to make back their investment. And they also need to 
reinvest in future research with that money. They, they have to pay for what it took to bring a drug to market. And if they don't reinvest in that 10 to 15 years of future research, then there won't be new drugs in the future. And this is balanced in our intellectual property system with a robust generic system that actively encourages um, generic competitors to come to market. And the timeline for that is a, a drug, apl a manufacturer applies for a patent well before a drug is approved, before clinical trials. Um, and then by the time of FDA approval, there's about 12, 14 years um, where that drug has exclusivity before a generic competitor can come to market with the same drug. It's important to remember that that doesn't mean there isn't competition. You heard about um, in the previous panel, uh, competition driving prices down in, uh, in that weight loss and obesity uh, drugs. So drugs have, most drugs have a competitor in class or within their, um, you know, with a different chemical structure within two years of being on the market. It's just not the generic um, competitor yet. Next slide, please. Um, this was covered very well by, uh, by the previous panelists and just wanna reiterate our robust generic system in the United States. We've had, uh, based on our the law, the Hatch-Waxman Act passed uh, 40 years ago, which has drastically increased the amount of generics that are on the market, um, and this is, we need this. We need this to bring costs down for patients and in order to balance new drugs, new innovations and inventions coming to market. And, and uh, the total share of the entire healthcare industry spent on prescription drugs has remained flat uh, at about 14% of total healthcare spending for many years, and CMS projects that it will remain 14% uh, for the, uh, several future years. Um, but there are many reasons why patients are not always benefiting from this generic competition. Um, next slide, please. As was discussed uh, by the previous presenter, there are other players in the supply chain that have incredible influence on what drugs are available. Just three companies uh, control the prescription formulary, prescription benefits for 80% of the United States, of, of the covered lives in the United States. So one specific example of how they are trolling uptake, we have had follow-on insulins available on the market for over five years now. However, as of 2023, none of the nation's three largest PBMs included the lower cost follow-on insulins in their national commercial formularies. So potentially um, a big swath of America is not able to realize the benefits of those follow on drugs coming to market. In the interest of uh, time, I wanna be respectful of time, I will end there, thank you. Thank you, Daria, very much. And please stick around, we've got two more analysts and then some questions. So we're gonna move next to Tanya sorel Neal. Thank you. My name is Tanya Neal. I am the Senior State Director for the Pharmaceutical Care Management a trade association representing the pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, pharmacy benefit managers are casually known as PBMs, and they're hired by a health plan sponsor to get the best price for the plan by utilizing a number of tools to increase competition and keep prices as low as possible. Um, you've heard today about several of the factors in the manufacturing research and development process that contributes to the cost of generic drugs, so I'm not going to cover those again but it is important to remember that all drug prices are set solely by the manufacturer. Uh, generic drugs provide health plans significant cost savings compared to brand name drugs. However, some direct generic drugs still have high costs. And I think it's important to look at the entire supply chain um, to understand those underlying factors that are driving costs. Uh, slide, please. Um, many patients interact only with their doctors and pharmacies to obtain their prescription drugs. However, the prescription drug distribution chain is a complex and it involves several stakeholders. These stakeholders, their contracts to determine how much a patient's health insurance pays, the patient's out-of-pocket costs, pharmacy reimbursements, and how the stakeholders are paid. You've heard about a couple of these already, so I'm uh, only going to mention the PSAOs, which is the Pharmaceutical Service Administration Organizations. 
PSAOs negotiate contracts with drug manufacturers on behalf of pharmacies, utilizing their combined purchasing power to secure favorable pricing and terms. Additionally, they manage relationships with PBMs and reimbursement processes, ensuring that pharmacies receive payments. By leveraging their expertise and industry connections, PSAOs play a vital role in, in empowering independent pharmacies. Overall, the drug supply chain involves collaboration between the manufacturers, the PSAOs, the wholesalers, PBMs, and the pharmacies to ensure the availability and safe distribution of the pharmaceuticals to the patients. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna focus for a minute on the value a PBM brings to the generic drugs conversation. There are several reasons why the state and employers choose to hire a PBM. Uh, PBMs save uh, more than three and a half million Oregonians, more than $1,000 each annually. Um, PBMs are highly regulated by federal and state government through a combination of the Department of Labor, Department of Health and Human Services, the Treasury and the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, as well as DCBS. One of the main values in hiring a PBM is the cost saving on generic drugs. Uh, these negotiated prices are often lower than what an employer could obtain independently. PBMs develop and maintain a list of preferred drugs known as a formulary, which guides prescribing practices. They use formularies to promote the use of generic drugs over brand name counterparts. PBMs negotiate rebates with drug manufacturers based on the volume of drugs prescribed, and they pass on some or all of the rebates back to the client, um, further reducing the cost of medications. On average, 90% of rebates are returned to the plan sponsor, and we do have um, companies that return 100%. Overall, hiring a PBM helps a plan leverage their purchasing power and expertise in managing prescription drug costs by utilizing the industry knowledge as well as their negotiation capabilities. Next slide. And two entities that influence generic drug pricing are the manufacturers who control the price of the drugs and the PBMs who influence the drug pricing to help lower the price of drugs by negotiating the best price possible, developing formularies and utilization management programs. PBMs negotiate contracts with pharmacies to ensure access to the plan's network in exchange for offering pharmacies a larger volume of patients. This lowers the overall cost of medicines for patients and insurers. The interplay between all of these stakeholders shapes the final price that consumers pay for prescription drugs. Next slide. PBMs utilize various tools to keep generic drug costs down, including a MAC list, which are predetermined maximum prices that pharmacies are reimbursed for specific generic drugs, step therapy, which are programs that encourage the use of generic drugs as a first-line treatment, which requires patients to try to lower, to try lower cost generic alternatives before being eligible for more expensive brand name medications. Um, also, prior authorization, which is used to review and approve the use of certain medications, including generics. These help ensure that only medically, medically necessary generics are prescribed, benefiting both the patient and the cost. There are even more tools that PBMs utilize in an effort to get the patients the best price um, for the right drug at the right time when they need it. Next slide. This slide recommends sorry, reflects the breakdown of the profit margins for different players in the supply chain. It's important to note that these profit margins range, profit margin ranges are approximate and can vary based on factors such as market competition, regulatory environment, uh, product mix, economies of scale. Additionally, these figures are subject to fluctuations over time as market dynamics changes. Next slide. In the United States, drug pricing is controlled by a combination of pharmaceutical manufacturers, regulatory authorities, insurers, and government agencies. Next slide. This is just a quick example of um, a significant increase in the price of Daraprim by Turing Pharmaceuticals from 2015. Daraprim is a medication used to treat parasitic infections, including malaria, and is considered a necessary drug for some patients. Um, Turing Pharmaceuticals acquired the rights to Daraprim um, and promptly raised the price from $13.50 to $750 per tablet, representing a 5,500% increase. While generic drugs are generally expected to be more affordable alternatives to brand name medications, there have been instances where generic drug manufacturers have significantly increased prices due to various factors, 
like limiting competition or lack of regulation. Next slide. And my last slide. The, there are several measures the state can take to help address generic drug pricing. Um, examine the PSAO and wholesale pricing models. Uh, ensure pharmacists can substitute biosimilars and brand name products for cost-effective alternatives. Focus on transparency for the entire drug supply chain, not just specific elements of the supply chain. And last, encourage the FDA to update patent practices to promote faster competition. Next slide. Thank you, and I'm available for questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Tanya. So off to our last presenter now, then we will have some questions. Glad to welcome Kevin Russell. Kevin, over to you. Hey, welcome everybody. Um, I'm gonna just try to give a more kind of a personal take of what's going on in a pharmacy in Oregon. Um, I'm the director of pharmacy at a, at a pharmacy in Redmond, Oregon, or a community pharmacy. Go ahead and move on to the next slide here. So some good news that I'm going to start with today is that, uh, you know, generics are still pretty affordable and, and in most cases. Um, at our pharmacy, I, I did some data for our prescriptions in the month of November, uh, and that 81% uh, of our prescriptions sold for less than $30 of what the, both the patient and the insurer paid. Um, and then 98% of those prescriptions were sold for less than $100. So, uh, yeah, so that's going pretty good. I think what most people see is that 2%, um, and that 2% can be a significant problem. So I, I analyzed the high cost generics that we've been dispensing. And I think that what I came up with here with our numbers is pretty close to what's going on in the, in the industry. And that is that uh, of the high cost generics, 29% were new generics to the market, which is that, you know, they're, they're coming to the market, they're being priced just below the brand name drugs initially. When more competitors come to the market, that price is going to go down later. So this is an expected number for those new generics. What's But what's, uh, I think, more alarming and, and is coming on a lot more recently is that 71% of those are long established generics with recent price hikes. Um, likely due to decreases in competition. And I think a lot of this is due to shortages. That's what we're seeing in our pharmacy. So um, a drug will have, you know, five or more manufacturers. All of a sudden, the product from four or five of those will come off the market for whatever reason, leaving one manufacturer left. Um, and we'll see price uh, of their product go from $10 up to, in one example, um, uh, 500 and some dollars um, of that single generic. And then when the generics, um, when other manufacturers, the short is over and other manufacturers come back on the market, then the prices come back down again. But we're seeing a lot more of this volunteer, volatility and seesawing going on that are affecting our patients. And what we do every day in our community pharmacy is help to move our patients to medicines that are more affordable when they run into these problems. Next slide, please. I want to highlight the example of what happens when there's a mandate for brand name drug when generics are available. Um, you know, PBMs do this because they, they negotiate a rebate with the, with the brand name company that's presumably less than what they could buy it for, the generic for. Um, and this is good if it doesn't disadvantage the patient. So I have two actual patient prescriptions here from our pharmacy where it was mandated to use brand name Advair, which is an inhaler for breathing and pretty much a life and death medicine for the people who use it. In the first example, the patient copay is $10 and their, their, their generic copay is $10. So in this case, the patient was not disadvantaged from uh, using the, that product. Uh, the, uh, I will say that our pharmacy, though, lost almost $68 on the product. They weren't paying the pharmacy the cost to buy the brand name drug, um, but they didn't disadvantage the, the patient. Um, in the second example here, the patient's copay was $104, and that represents approximately what the full price of the generic inhaler costs. Um, so the patient's really receiving no prescription benefit in this case, 
Um, and I did look up this person's benefit and they would pay a 25% copay for their generics. And they are not benefiting from that 25% copay um, when, the, when their PBM is mandating they use the brand name. They're basically paying the full market price for that product. I will also say that um, what happened today is we had that Adver became unavailable on the market. And we called for an override with the PVM to try to get a generic covered for a patient because the Advair was no longer available. And uh, they denied that um, coverage and said that they would not pay for another brand um, despite it being unavailable on the market. And since this is a life and death uh, medicine, I think that was a pretty horrible thing. And we're gonna be working with the patient to help appeal that. Uh, next slide, please. So about specialty ger ger gener <laughs> generics and biosimilars, um, most of those are filled at PBM-affiliated specialty pharmacies. Whether they're truly a specialty drug or not, they restrict pretty much any high-cost medicine to their own affiliated pharmacies. Um, the reference study in here showed that in 2021, um, uh, the drug dimethyl fumarate um, would have cost about $350 if it was filled at a community pharmacy. And the PBM affiliated pharmacies billed Oregon Medicaid an average of $2,928 for that drug. Well, another question is, is this actually affecting patients in the commercial space still today? And the answer is yes. Um, the, uh, I have a patient that came in to me and said, can you get dimethyl fumarate? And I said, yes, I can. And she says, how much would it be? I said, it would be $94. And she said that that's incredible because she is paying a copay from her specialty pharmacy of about $300. And she was supposed to be getting a 20% copay. So she is not getting the benefit that, you know, the cost savings that are supposed to be coming to the patient of using, a, a being restricted to a PBM associated pharmacy is just not happening. Um, you know, we need to get these prescriptions back into community pharmacies where there's accountability and pharmacists that can help them with these things. Last slide, please. So how can Oregon help, uh, number one, pass some PBM reform? That's coming up in next legislative session. Uh, we are looking to get that passed. Number two, require negotiated savings to be passed on to patients. Um, that Advair example is a perfect example where that patient should have been paying closer to $25, not $104. And uh, support national efforts for reducing drug shortages. If we can reduce the volatility in the generic marketplace due to shortages, then we can reduce the overall cost of generic drugs. But thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. So at, at this time, I'd asked all the panelists and our moderators to come back on camera and we've got some time and can it open it up for questions or comments for these panelists and uh, Senator Patterson, I see your hand up. So please go right ahead. Oh, thank you so much, Commissioner Stolfi. Um, I was looking up um, at the National Institutes of Health about funding for the development uh, of, of pharmaceuticals. And let's just look at one example. Um, the U.S. government, according to the National um, uh, Institute of Health invested at least $31.9 billion to develop and produce the mRNA uh, COVID-19 vaccinations, vaccines, and also much research that is done um, to develop pharmaceuticals is done. The basic um, science behind it, that much, much of that research is done at our state universities and in addition to, so that's a huge investment. In addition to that, most of the scientists that are employed at the pharmaceutical uh, companies are in our country have been educated at, the, at those state universities and we've invested a great deal in that. So I don't think we're really capturing the true cost of what we as a nation have invested in the development of pharmaceuticals. And I think that the American public and our, our Oregonian um, fellow neighbors deserve um, the benefit of um, that those investments rather than paying a higher price than anybody else around the world. Um, I'd like to um, ask a question, and that is, um, and I, this can be for another time, but I just would like to put it out there. Um, are pharmacy benefit managers, uh, are PBMs 
operative in other countries? And if so, how do they, how does that work? I realize that they do provide a valuable service, but I'd like to know um, how that works financially in other countries. And then I just finally like to note that um, there was a 4% profit margin for pharmacists, um, for pharmacies noted. And yet we heard that pharmacists are often dispensing pharmaceuticals below cost. And so um, I'd just like to thank you for your efforts to help support our needed pharmacists, our community pharmacists, um, as well as our, our individual patients. So sorry, I know there was a lot in there, but um, anyway, thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters. Senator, any, any of the panelists care to take uh, a response or, or answer any of the questions in there? Well, I'll take, I'll take the, the latter part of the question, which is regarding the profitability of pharmacy. I would definitely dispute that as far as the you know, the, the PBMs are one of the most profitable businesses in the United States or in, and are in the, you know, a lot of them are in the, the top 10 of all companies in the United States that have developed over the last 20 years. Pharmacies are not making money anymore. Um, and we've had 30 pharmacies closed in the state of Oregon this year. Um, there will be more closed next year. Um, and there is there is not a way on prescription drugs through, through, through paying through insurance for a pharmacy to stay in business nowadays. Is there's just not enough margin left in that equation to stay in business. So um, it's, it's pretty dire out there as far as the margins that's remaining for pharmacies. I mean, Representative Goodwin. Oh, um. I get my camera on and not my microphone. Kevin, I'd like to follow along with you a little bit more on the pharmacy perspective. So we have this MAC pricing, this maximum allowable cost, and yet in our smaller, lower volume pharmacies, they're very limited in where they can actually purchase from their wholesalers, right? There's not, and there's, correct me if I'm wrong, there's enormous variability. And so you were sort of locked into a price and then penalized if that price could actually be lower somewhere else from another wholesaler that you don't have access to, or do I understand that well? Yeah, I mean, basically the, the MAC is just kind of a, a made up price that, that a PBM is going to pay a pharmacy for, a, for usually a generic drug. Um, and then, you know, it's really up to the pharmacy to try to obtain drugs below that um, to be able to make any type of margin on, on that medicine. Sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. But, uh, you know, sometimes it's pretty bad. So you look at albuterol inhalers. Um, I think most MAC prices on those are they're paying us around $9 for an inhaler. I haven't seen a inhaler below twenty dollars in from any supplier or any wholesaler in years, um, and that number doesn't get adjusted. Um, so it's it's just things like that that are are very tough. And I would say it's it's much more tough now with drug shortages, because before you had you know maybe you had ten generics out there and you could you could really try to to, to see when one of them went at a low price and try to buy. Um, and look at all your wholesalers. But nowadays, it's like you're trying to take care of a patient, and you may only be able to get one single um, make or manufacturer of a drug is available at all to take care of a patient. And you can buy that drug at $34, and you get paid $17. You know, it's like, well, I'm, I'm buying this to take care of your patient. It's the only drug available for them, but you won't pay me for it, right? Um, I don't have an option to go buy that drug at, at below $17. I haven't had that option in months. So, And is it true, Kevin, that you actually do not know at the moment, a point of sale, what you will be reimbursed? You could actually, you, you may not know when that is being adjudicated, what may be clawed back from even what you thought might be um, a small margin. Yeah, that's true. It's like, because a lot of these contracts operate on things called brand effective rates, generic effective rates, and so they can adjust and take money back from you later, um, despite you have whatever you adjudicate at the point of sale. Um, and so that's a, 
It's definitely a big deal with DIR fees. The DIR fees go away in their current form at the beginning of the year. So we'll see if in the Medicare space, if we have more transparency to those sales, because that's the biggest problem there. Yes, thank you. Thank you. See if there are any more questions. And, and while you're thinking there was a, Kevin, you could probably answer this pretty quick. A question in the chat came in, uh, whether pharmacists are still prohibited from telling a customer when the cost is less to pay cash than to use their insurance to pay for a prescription. <laughs> oh, I think most of us probably uh, ignore that. Um, but I don't believe that's the case in the in any longer. I think there's enough legislation has passed now that, yes. that uh, we're protected on that now. I think most of us were ignoring that anyway. We wanted to take care of our customers regardless. So thank you, Kevin. Any other questions from the panelists? Um, I, I, I've got one, uh, uh, perhaps the last one here. So, you know, we, we talk a lot about competition and the importance of that. And then generics, when they enter the market, can create competition. One of the things we're seeing in the data is that there could be several generics all at the same price, which doesn't really then spur competition between those generics. Uh, curious if any of the panelists have views on if there's anything payers, providers, policymakers, anyone can do uh, around that to help spur competition. Sure, um, I can take part of that, I think. Um, so, you know, one of the issues that we've 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 seen um, in the marketplace is just the consolidation on the purchasing side. So, those entities, many of them vertically integrated with health plans and PBMs, who are purchasing generic medications. So, for example, CVS Health um, and its Caremark PBM um, are aligned with Red Oak Purchasing, which um, provides all of the generic purchasing across the entire marketplace for Caremark Book of Business, um, for um, Caremark Mail. And then they also are a contracted supplier for Optum Mail Services. So that's just one example, but it goes to show you how one entity has a significant amount of leverage relative to purchasing in the marketplace. And um, that same relationship exists um, um, with Walgreens Boots Alliance and with McKesson. Um, and Amerisource. So um, I guess what I would say is that, you know, from our perspective, from the perspective of an association that represents a, a um, I wouldn't say dwindling, but a shrinking number of generic suppliers, the leverage that manufacturers have in the marketplace is, is getting more and more limited relative to the leverage that um, health plans and their affiliated purchasing entities or sourcing entities have in the marketplace. So I think maybe some of the consistency you're seeing in pricing is just related to the fact that there are fewer sourcing agents out there across the entire marketplace, um, supplying pharmacies and, um, and ultimately providing the drugs that are um, dispensed by those pharmacies. Yeah, please, Daria. I just okay. I want to uh, agree uh, with with that and just as, um, remind folks, as you very well know, that uh, list price is a poor metric for actual cost paid. So sometimes those comparisons are um, not showing you what's happening with the net price or the actual what what payers are paying and they're obfuscating uh, what you're seeing there. Thank you for that. Uh, Kevin, did you have something to share as well? Yeah, I think it's after following this for many years, it kind of follows other things in the general public marketplace outside of even healthcare, which is, you know, you'll see people come out with a product that's all pretty similar in price, and that's pretty normal. And then someone will go low, and then that changes everything, right? And that's what, if you'll take an example of bupropion. So bupropion was a fairly inexpensive medication. Um, generic's been out a long time, but for curiously in the Excel form, um, it's been sitting with three or four manufacturers at over $100 a bottle for quite some time now, um, which was kind of weird because it used to be so inexpensive and there's multiple manufacturers. Well, just last week, one of them dropped their price to $9. <laughs> and then the rest of them just followed suit. So, 
it's like it's uh, you know whoever blinks first, right? I'm not I'm not saying there was collusion there, but someone was someone was waiting, and then it passed. So so market forces worked out eventually. If I might um, offer real quickly on the MAC price a comment. Um, the MAC price is established based on the average cost of the generic drug in the market. So it's not it's not necessarily a made up drug or price. It's actually based on um, averages. Just wanted to pop that out there for the record. Well, it's completely opaque. I mean, we don't get to know how that's calculated, right? Uh, no one can audit that. So, and from from my stance across all what I'm seeing across all payers and all PBMs is that it complete seems to be completely random. So, you know, I'll get paid. Mac will be 17 for one, nine for another, 23 for another. It, it's not consistent. Representative Goodwin, were you coming in? Um, well, I do have a question, yeah. Daria, uh, if you will. Would you help me understand a little better the manufacturer's coupons that they offer directly to um, the consumer? And how is that done? And what drugs? I think that's for the specialty drugs primarily. But could you just clarify that process for me a little more? Sure. Yes, Rep. Goodwin, thank you for the um, question. Uh, well, copay assistance broadly, read, sometimes called coupons, but there's different kinds of copay assistance programs, um, have stepped in to help patients in a system where the, the insurance is not working for them. Um, you know, the, the, our critics will often say that, and I think has been said uh, it, recently that the, the manufacturer copay assistance is trying to drive or keep patients on a brand name when there is a lower cost generic available. But what the data shows is that only 1% of the time that those are used, was there a generic available? So 99% of the time that argument falls apart. And, and, and what they're used for is when patients need a medicine that they cannot access, that is, is being priced their, their copay is too high for them, their cost sharing is too high, maybe they have failed on other medicines and their, their plan won't allow them the medicine that they and their doctor have decided is the best for them. So the, the manufacturers will um, have programs available that will help them uh, either access a medicine that's not covered by their formulary or get across their um, deductibles so that they don't have the huge high and low of their uh, of of costs at, at the beginning of the year every year to kind of smooth that out. So they've stepped in to help patients when patients are not able to afford the medicine that they need. So it can be short term in in helping uh, the the consumer with the deductible, but then it will have to become the insurer's responsibility. It can be. There are different there are different types of copay assistance, but for uh, patients who have insurance coverage where the that's what they pay for their premium for is to be covered in the end right but there is a deductible phase um, and they're being hurt during that deductible phase then that type of copay assistance is intended to be lim term limited at the beginning of the year or you know the beginning of their de deductible phase to get them through that pain point until their uh, insurance plan kicks in okay thank you Tari. Okay, hey, any last questions from our moderators? Okay, well, thank you to the second panelists uh, very much for joining us and for answering the questions. Um, at this time, we're gonna move on. We, we have our last public comment period and I do have seven people who have signed up to testify. Uh, so I'll call you up. Uh, you'll be able to turn on your video if you'd like. Uh, I could share your comments or stories, uh, please, we've got seven people, try to keep your comments to around three minutes or so, uh, so we can get through that all, and we'll see if anyone else signs up while we're going. Uh, first person we have is J.S. Halshikar. Thank you. Um, 
Moderators, uh, Prescription Drug Affordability uh, Board members, my name is J. H. Palshakar. I work as a bedside nurse in a community hospital that serves Washington County. And today I'm speaking as a member of Oregon Nurses Association. Oregon Nurses Association is a nurses union and professional association representing over 16,000 healthcare workers and providers, including registered nurses, advanced practice nurses, and allied health workers. Our members work in urban and rural hospitals, clinics, school-based health centers, home health, and county health departments across Oregon. While I specialize in inpatient care, I'm always thinking about how to keep my patients healthy when they leave the hospital and how to reduce the risk of readmission. Making sure my patients have access to affordable prescription medications is a critical part of helping my patients stay healthy, live their best lives, and importantly, keeping them out of the hospital. I would like to share several trends I've noticed about how affordability of prescription medications have impacted people's lives and how short-term decisions related to medication affordability have unnecessarily detracted from quality of life and resulted in costly and unnecessary, unnecessary visits to the ER and hospitalizations. I've seen necessary medications that are simply not taken because of affordability. One woman I cared for recently was brought to the hospital after having a seizure. She had epilepsy and was on medication, but was cutting back. This was solely because she couldn't afford a full month of medications and she wanted to make sure she had some for later in the month. Because she felt she had no access to affordable prescription medications, she put her life at risk. Um, another group of patients I feel are important to highlight are those who, have, uh, who live with mental illness. When I work in the emergency room, it's common for patients to come in requesting a refill for psychiatric medications, or worse, they would be brought in because they ran out of their meds and ended up in crisis. Medication affordability has direct impacts on quality of life, and in many instances, there are impacts on general health, disability, and even length of life. Prescription medications can cost hundreds of dollars a month, which can seem like a lot, but the alternatives of repeated ER visits and hospitalizations cost much more to individuals and the citizens of Oregon than making prescription medication affordable. I would like to thank members of the Prescription Drug Affordability uh, Board for considering the impacts of prescription drug prices. Oregon Nurses Association, as a member of the Oregon Coalition for Affordable Prescriptions, continues to work on this issue as well, and we're grateful for the work of this board. Thank you. Thank you, Jayesh. Next, uh, glad to hear from Tracy Zvenich. Thank you, Commissioner Solfi, for holding this important hearing on prescription drug pricing transparency. My name is Dr. Tracy Zvenich. I am the Director of Policy Strategy and Alliances for the Obesity Action Coalition. Specifically, my comments will focus on drugs for chronic weight management, also known as anti-obesity medications or AOMs. OEC is the leading national nonprofit dedicated to people living with obesity and serves over 80,000 individuals across the U.S. and more than 863 members in Oregon. Obesity is driven by strong biology, not by choice. Obesity is a serious chronic disease that requires treatment and management just like diabetes, cancer, or high blood pressure. OAC believes that people living with obesity should have equitable access to treatments that can be life-saving and improve health and well-being. A top barrier to care is the high cost of FDA-approved AOMs. We hear from our members all the time that the newest and most effective AOMs are often too expensive to pay for out of pocket, and they are not covered by the majority of health insurance plans. Cost and coverage issues are keeping safe and effective treatments away from people who need them most. One group, uh, one group living with, with a chronic disease is not more deserving than another. It should be no different for someone living with obesity needing a, a medication as it would be for someone living with diabetes. Bringing down the price and adding coverage for AOMs will save lives and help address access disparities. OAC calls for several reforms to expand access to obesity care, which are included in our written testimony. ICER recommends that states should include coverage for weight loss medications under, Medicaid, under the Medicaid program and other payers should ensure that pharmaceutical benefit designs 
developed in conjunction with employers and other plan sponsors, ensure access to approved therapies among individuals with obesity. I'd like to add a couple evidence updates to follow earlier speakers. A recent report from the American Enterprise Institute found that the estimated discount from list to net price for GLP-1s was 48% to 79%, so in some cases already meeting or exceeding the ICER recommendation. I'd also mention the reference to a 27% adherence rate for AOMs. A new study was published just yesterday in the journal Obesity that showed patients taking semaglutide in particular had 40% adherence or persistence at one year. It would be great to include that study in your evidence review. So in conclusion, OAC believes the state and state legislature should take action to ensure coverage for obesity, comprehensive obesity care, including FDA approved AOMs. OAC appreciates the opportunity to provide comments on this critical issue. We'd like to partner and work with you all and serve as a resource to identify solutions for people living with obesity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. So next, uh, I'd like to hear from Crystal Hartman. Hi, can you hear me okay? Perfect, okay. So thank you to the Oregon Department of Consumer and Business Services for holding this hearing on drug pricing transparency for drugs approved for diabetes and for chronic weight management, also referred to as anti-obesity medication. My name is Crystal Hartman, and I serve as the chair of the National Board of Directors for the Obesity Action Coalition, and I work really closely with Tracy. The OAC is a leading national nonprofit dedicated to serving people with obesity through awareness, support, education, and advocacy. So my shirt says OAC advocate right here. Our vision is to create a society where all individuals are treated with respect and without discrimination or bias, regardless of their size or weight. We strive for those affected by the disease of obesity to have the right to access safe and effective treatment options. And we educate all individuals to understand that when it comes to health, weight matters. OAC has a strong and growing membership of over, over 80,000 individuals living with obesity across the United States and more than 863 members in Oregon. The Obesity Action Coalition, Coalition or OAC, is pleased to provide the following comments regarding the drug, price, uh, drug pricing transparency, specifically on drugs approved for diabetes and for chronic weight management. We believe that people living with a chronic disease of obesity should have equitable access to treatments that can be life-saving and improve health and well-being. Unfortunately, it is quite common for people with obesity to struggle with accessing treatments and services to manage their obesity. A top barrier to care is the high cost of FDA-approved anti-obesity medications, or AOM. Um, Andrew, I want to thank you for sharing my story. You were, uh, my story was one of the, the three stories you read um, at the very beginning of the hearing. Um, and rather than repeat that, um, because hopefully most people were able to, to, hear, um, to hear you share my story, I just want to give a, a quick comment about a recent experience I've had as a patient with obesity. Um, I had my first colonoscopy and an upper endoscopy at the exact same time, and related to those procedures, my um, gastroenterologist asked me to go off of my GLP-1 medication for two weeks. Um, while I didn't change any of my lifestyle habits, which included what I ate, how I exercised, um, those, that two-week period that I was off of my anti-obesity GLP-1 medications, I gained 12 pounds. Um, that 12 pounds in that two-week time period was enough to take me from a normal BMI to an overweight BMI. And that is how sensitive my body is to obesity. The minute I let off the pedal for a second, even by not being able to take my medication, um, I am up 12 pounds and I am no longer living with a normal BMI. I am living with an overweight BMI in two weeks time. And so that's why it's so incredibly important for my personal journey and for the journey of many people who are living with obesity to have access to affordable medications um, right now, I'm on a diabetes dose because I have high insulin resistance. Um, I can't get access, nor can I afford the uh, weight management doses of these medications we've been talking about today. Uh, it's obviously super important for my body to have this on board. 
So anyway, in conclusion, obesity is driven by strong biology. I just told you exactly what my biology did when I, when I had to take one of my tools out of the toolbox, which was the GLT-1 medication. And it's not by choice. It wasn't because I was doing anything differently during those two weeks. Obesity is treatable just like diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure, heart disease, and bringing down the price for anti-obesity medications will save lives and help address health disparities. One chronic disease is not more deserving than another. It should be no different for someone living with obesity needing medications as it would be for someone living with diabetes needing medications. All people deserve affordable medications. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to share my story today, and we look forward to working with you on this important issue. Thank you, Crystal, for being here and for sharing your story. Thank you. So next, thank you. Uh, so next we have Yolanda Clay. Hello, my name is Yolanda. I'm a member of the, of the Obesity Action Coalition. And I wanna thank you for allowing me to give my personal statement on this important matter. Chronic obesity is a complex disease and science has proven that it's more than just calories in and calories out or a lack of willpower. In 2013, the American Medical Association officially declared obesity a disease, but society, society still treats people affected differently than other diseases. In the 90s, I'd weighed 260 pounds. I worked in a low paying job as a nursing assistant and I lived on broth based soups with protein and vegetables. And I still managed to gain weight despite working a physical job. In 2004, I weighed 320 pounds and I had internalized much of society's negative biases. I began a low carb diet and I lost hundred pounds. But after nine months, I began experiencing side effects and the restrictiveness of it was wearing on me. I sought advice from my doctor and she told me to eat a banana. So I went home and ate a banana. I gave five pounds overnight and it seemed like my body was absorbing calories triple time. I gained all my weight back and plus some. In my forties, I reached my highest weight ever, 410 pounds. My doctors referred me to a bariatric surgeon and I had sleeve gastrectomy surgery. With hard work and surgery, I got down to 249 pounds, but I still struggled with keeping my weight off. This year, I was able to add Ozempic to my treatment plan and I lost over 30 pounds. A few months later, I had bariatric revision surgery due to severe GERD, but my surgeon explained that this surgery was not for weight loss. I only started to reduce weight again after restarting Ozempic. Currently, I weigh 175 pounds and I'm moving closer to a healthy goal weight of 150 pounds. I'm afraid all my momentum to create positive health gains will cease in 2024 because my insurance company will no longer cover a Zimpic for me. And I cannot afford the $1,300 out of pocket cost per month. My overall health improved on a Zimpic. My mental health improved. My A1C is within normal ranges. My high blood pressure has improved and I might be able to delay knee replacement surgery on both knees. Also, my sleep apnea may have been resolved. So why isn't chronic obesity treated the same? I believe weight bias plays a role in the decision to deny and charge more for these medications. You must treat obesity like any other chronic disease and cover all proven treatment options. The high cost for these medications need to be reined in like we did recently for insulin pricing. Oregon ranks 39th in the states impacted by obesity. This makes the need for expanded access to care even more urgent. Oregon has a history of paving firsts in this nation. Please let expanding anti-obesity medication coverage for all to be another. Thank you. Thank you, Londa. Thank you uh, as well for being here and for sharing your story. Uh, so next we have, and I've got three more people on my list uh, signed up for public testimony. And next we have Emerson Hamlin. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner moderators, for the record, my name is Emerson Hamlin. I use they, them pronouns, and I work for the Oregon Nurses Association. Jayesh already introduced us in his testimony, so I'll just reiterate that ONA is a proud member of the Oregon Coalition for Affordable Prescriptions. I'm speaking today for ONA and as a member of OCAP's executive committee. OCAP is a diverse coalition of organizations and advocates that work to increase transparency, 
for the prescription drug industry and rein in drug prices. Both ONA and OCAP are grateful for the work of the legislature and the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. Their efforts to increase transparency and to lower drug costs for consumers is deeply appreciated and sets our state on the path to ensure that everyone can get the medication they need without financial hardship. However, we recognize that there is more work to be done. In OHA's report entitled Impact of Healthcare Costs on People in Oregon in 2021, released in September of 2023, 26% of Oregonians reported that they had cut pills in half, skipped doses, or did not fill a prescription due to the medication's costs. For those who did receive healthcare services, including getting their medications, 13% reported that doing so used up most or all of their savings. These reports mirror what our nurses and allied healthcare workers see. One family nurse practitioner, or FMP, that I spoke with shared that she had a patient who came to see her with very severe COPD after lacking health insurance and being unable to afford medication for years. She arranged for him to see a pulmonologist and she prescribed him medications and inhalers. Unfortunately, the years without treatments were insurmountable and he died of respiratory failure several months after their first visit. When reflecting on his life and treatment, the FMP said that she believed if he had access to affordable treatment and medication earlier, he would likely still be alive today. This FMP is not alone. Another nurse told me that making sure her patients got the care they needed, including medication, was emotionally exhausting. The uncertainty and worry that they may not be able to afford their necessary treatments kept her up at night. Our healthcare providers, their patients and families, and our communities across Oregon deserve better. Both ONA and OCAP respectfully ask DCBS, PDAB, and the legislature to continue to work towards transparency in drug pricing and lowering the cost of prescription drugs. Thank you for considering these comments. Thank you very much, Emerson. So next, I've got Lauren Sant. Hi, thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. My name is Lauren Sant. I'm the Executive Director of the Caring Ambassadors Program in Portland, Oregon, or actually Oregon City. Uh, we are a national nonprofit organization that does education and advocacy for people with lung cancer, hepatitis C, and other chronic diseases. Um, I would really like to ask you guys to take into consideration the cost savings and not just look at the cost of a drug. For example, does one drug uh, allow the patient to utilize the uh, healthcare system less? Do they go to the emergency room less? Um, are they more productive? Do they adhere better? All of those things need to be taken into consideration. I haven't heard much from um, patients on this in your deliberations in the past, and I, I hope that that's taken into consideration. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and that the whole system is looking at transparency. Uh, for example, the new drugs for hepatitis C came out extremely expensive. I get that. But the drug prior to that was cheap, but only 70% of people couldn't take the drug because it was so toxic. And so we were spending more than $5,000 a year on each individual with hepatitis C in our state. And yet now we can treat those people and cure them and have them done with their disease and they're not getting liver cancer. They're not dying from hepatitis C. So please take into consideration reduced morbidity and mortality when you look at the drug price and the overall drug price. Um, and I just wanna say one thing about the meeting today. Um, I was, some great presentations, but I was a little disappointed that Oregon is once again listening to ICER. ICER uses qualities. Qualities are illegal and they discriminate and they discriminate against people with chronic disease, against people with disabilities. Um, someone with lung cancer has a quality score of 0.58. They start off with that. They're, they're not even considered they're just barely a half a person because they've been diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, that's not acceptable. Treatment is becoming more individualized. It's more survivable. We can't have a one size fits all healthcare policy because it doesn't take into account and, um, and it restricts access to optimal care and ignores the physician and the patient decision. So as the focus of the state focuses on the entire healthcare system, please keep health equity in mind please keep uh, qualities out of it. And that goes for both the uh, PDAP, PDAP and the Drug Transparency Board. I um, wanna thank you again. I know you guys have a lot of work to do and it's a huge job and uh, appreciate what you're trying to do and lowering the cost for everyone. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Lauren. Uh, so last person I have on, on the list I see is there, Leslie Ann Hayward Story. Uh, over to you. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Leslie Ann Hayward Story. I'm a board certified obesity medicine, endocrinology, and diabetes specialist. I work at Oregon Health and Sciences University. Lack of insurance coverage for anti-obesity medications deeply impacts my patients and my ability to provide evidence-based care for them. Despite that obesity is recognized as a disease, we do not currently have access to the most effective medications for treatment um, because of the lack of insurance coverage for pharmacotherapy. Um, Obesity is the result of a pathologic change in a person's weight set point in the brain brought on by hormonal changes. It is not due to lack of control or any personal failing. Obesity and overweight are diseases that require appropriate medical management. Treatment of obesity is of, par of paramount importance. Obesity is linked to all-cause mortality, coronary artery disease, stroke, dyslipidemias, type 2 diabetes, and some types of cancer. The Obesity Society published a consensus statement recently that included um, obesity is a highly prevalent chronic disease characterized by excessive fat accumulation or distribution that presents risk to health and requires lifelong care. Virtually every system in the body is affected by obesity. Every person with obesity should have access to evidence-based treatment. The most effective treatments for obesity, the GLP-1 agonists and GLP-1 slash GIP agonists are also used to treat diabetes or type two diabetes. Due to high demand, these medications are on shortage. While some would argue that medication should be reserved for those with type two diabetes, the reality is that patients with obesity also need access. Semaglutide has been shown to reduce body weight significantly compared to placebo, and it's worth noting that patients in these studies uh, who receive medication and placebo would both be utilizing lifestyle modifications, including diet and exercise. Trisepatide, a newer agent, um, has been shown to reduce total body weight by amounts that are approaching outcomes seen in surgery with a gastric sleeve procedure. Not only is it important that these medications are effective for weight loss, but it also is important that they reduce risk uh, to health that are associated with overweight and obesity. Uh, the SELECT trial recently came out and it showed uh, that it was superior in patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease and overweight and obesity, but without diabetes in reducing the incidence of death from cardiovascular disease non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke at a follow-up of 39.8 months. Uh, this study, and I assume that more will be coming out soon, provides essential evidence that serious health outcomes for patients with overweight and obesity can be prevented, uh, but, they, but patients need to have access to appropriate care. Um, in summary, access to GLP-1 agonists and GLP-1 and GIP agonists are equally essential for patients with diseases of overweight and obesity as they are for patients with diabetes. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to share today. I appreciate the group's time. Thank you very much, doctor. So with that, we, we've reached the end of our agenda. I appreciate everyone staying on for a little bit longer than our scheduled time. Um, I believe all of our, our moderators have uh, had to go, but uh, on behalf of the department, I want to, again, thank everyone for being here. I want to extend special thanks to Senator Patterson, Representatives Goodwin, Javadi, and Nose uh, for being here, to all of our panelists uh, for their presentations and for all the questions that came in. Uh, there is the uh, email address on the slide right there. We uh, would very much welcome any additional comments or questions uh, to rxprices at gcbsoregon.gov. And again, thank you for your participation and have a great day.